I'd like to call the uh, hearing to order this morning, and uh, today we can continue our hearings on the American Energy Initiative. This is actually uh, the 28th day, and today we're going to talk about what I consider some very good news, and that is the achievability of North American energy independence and particularly oil independence within the span of a mere decade. As a matter of fact, one of our witnesses today made the comment in a study, comprehensive study, that by the end of the decade, they estimate that new U.S. oil and gas production could add at least 200 to $300 billion in revenue, which in turn could stimulate many hundreds of billions more in economic activity, investment, and consumption creating at least two and as high as three and a half million new jobs. So after many decades of hearing that the U.S. There's, had basically reached the end of its reserve, as a matter of fact, as recently as 2010, President Obama stated in a national address that we are running out of places to drill and he still cites the outdated and misleading claim that we possess only 2% of the world's oil reserves. But this pessimistic view is being blown away by reality. Increased domestic oil production is already cutting into the amount we need to import from oil exporting nations, and many experts believe that this production growth can continue for years to come. And when you add the equally impressive growth from our ally Canada, the goal of North American oil independence could be reached in as little as a decade. The global implications are tremendous because the one thing that has not changed is the instability in the Middle East and the hostility of several major oil producing nations uh, toward the United States. However, the, the more oil that is produced in the U.S. and Canada, the less leverage OPEC or any of its individual member nations can exert over us. And now we have the chance to reduce the leverage virtually to zero with North American oil independence. And the geopolitical benefits alone are enough to make this goal worthwhile, and the economic benefits are simply icing on the cake. North American energy independence would bring with it hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of new jobs in a rejuvenated energy industry. Indeed, it would succeed where, unfortunately, our stimulus package failed. And rather than cost over $800 billion, it would actually add revenues to the federal treasury. And when you compare the real oil industry jobs already being created in states like North Dakota, and uh, as you know, in, in uh, North Dakota right now, the unemployment rate is less than 3%. And all the experts agree that that primarily comes from the fact of the uh, new oil fields that have been hit there, the jobs that are being created. And not only can we talk about oil, but we also can talk about independence and natural gas because of the tremendous fines that we're finding in that area. President Obama has not really been helpful to us in this effort, in my view. As you know, he rejected the Keystone Pipeline that would allow 700,000 barrels per day of additional Canadian oil to come into the country. And without that, Canada's growing surplus of oil uh, may go to China and other willing buyers abroad. One of the areas that we certainly want to get into today as well is because we hear constantly from some individuals that even though the U.S. may increase its oil production, it's not going to have any impact on the price of oil. And I'd like to have an additional discussion about that today because uh, there was a law of supply and demand that's been with us for many years that if you have uh, more supply, uh, you, you can uh, decrease prices or if you reduce demand, uh, you can increase price, uh, decrease prices. So uh, we want to get into a discussion on that today as well. We have a, a panel of expert witnesses today, all who have practical experience and academic experience, 
and are quite knowledgeable in this area. So we look forward to all of your testimony. And at this time, I'd like to introduce the and recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Rush, for his opening statement. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are here today examining the issue of how we may reach North American energy independence within the next decade. This hearing, Mr. Chairman, gives us an opportunity to discuss the many different initiatives that President Obama has put in place to help us uh, come closer to reaching this goal. Mr. Chairman, I like this simplistic, Sarah Palin-centered uh, drill, baby drill, Ro Romney Ryan energy plan. President Obama has put forward a comprehensive energy policy that encompasses concrete proposals to not only make us less reliant on imported oil from overseas, but which also takes into account the serious issue of climate change. And while my Republican colleagues are loath to even mention the words climate change and have claimed it to be a hoax, I can assure you, uh, Mr. Chairman, that most of the farmers across this nation will agree, disagree with that position as we have witnessed the worst year of record temperatures, drought, and crop loss in modern uh, American history. Mr. Chairman, in 2011, uh, the Obama introduced uh, and released the Obama administration's energy plan titled Blueprint for Secure Energy Future. This comprehensive energy proposal would build a, quote, 21st century clean energy economy by reducing our dependence on oil, focusing on expanding clean energy sources of electricity, and achieving additional energy efficiency through a combination of all of the above energy policy. I, I would add, the Obama strategy strongly promotes the creation of jobs by developing renewable energy sources, such as wind, solar, biomass, and hydropower, while also investing in clean, in clean coal technology, increasing production of natural gas, and expanding nuclear power. However, however <clears throat> unlike <clears throat> the Romney plan, the Obama energy proposal endorses safe and responsible production of domestic energy sources, which allows input from community members and stakeholders who are directly impacted by oil and gas drilling. Any credible expert would have to give credit to the Obama administration for the advances that they have put in place to put us on track for achieving energy independence, which include increased domestic production, a move towards cleaner and renewable energy sources of the future, as well as additional conservation and energy efficiency measures. U.S. oil consumption, which peaked in 2005, dropped by more than 1.9 million, million barrels per day, or about 9% by 2011. While some of this recent decline in demand was related to the economic 
recession, improvements in fuel efficiency, and broader economic trends put forth by the Obama administration are also are responsible for these developments. <clears throat> One instance, the Obama administration's vehicle greenhouse gas and fuel economy standards for model years 2012 to 2025 are projected to save more than 2.2 million barrels of oil per day by the year 2025 and will help, will help us become less reliant on both oil imports and oil in general. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to this hearing. I expect to have robust interaction uh, among and uh, the witnesses today and the members of, of, of both sides. And Mr. Chairman, I sincerely hope that we can have a balanced and honest debate on these and all the ancillary <laughs> issues. And I thank you and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Rush. At this time, I'd like to recognize the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, Chairman of the Full Committee, for an opening statement. Well, thank you. No administration has talked more about technological breakthroughs in the energy sector or spent more tax dollars on failed attempts to achieve them than the current one. Yet in a genuinely transformative energy re revolution has emerged, and it has happened in spite of those policies. The advances in drilling technology that we'll hear about today have accomplished more for the American people than all of the Solyndras and the other federal stimulus giveaways combined. They've already rewritten the conventional wisdom that America's natural gas production is declining, and we are now doing the same for domestic oil production. In fact, predictions of dwindling North American oil supplies have been replaced with a very realistic prediction of North American oil independence within a decade. Indeed, while the president was trying to convince Americans that Solyndra's new solar panels would take the world by storm and create green jobs, these game-changing energy breakthroughs have quietly continued to unfold in places like the Bakken Formation in North Dakota and other state and private lands where the federal government has little or no role. And unlike Solyndra and other Title 17 loan guarantees that have been a sponge for taxpayer dollars, achieving North American oil independence won't cost the American people a single dime. All it requires is that the federal government get out of the way. But getting out of the way is something that this administration has refused to do. It continues to go slow approach to oil leasing on federal lands and offshore. For example, its most recent five-year plan for offshore leasing offers fewer lease sales than under any president, Democrat or Republican, all the way back to Jimmy Carter. And the administration's pace of onshore leasing is below that of his predecessors. Even those federal areas already under lease are now being subjected to unprecedented permitting delays. In fact, nearly all of the increase in domestic oil supplies is coming from state and private lands, but on federal lands, production has actually dropped 100 million barrels this last year. The dramatic improvements in drilling technology that are responsible for increased oil production on non-federal lands have not yet been given the chance to do so on federal lands. Same is true of vital oil infrastructure. The administration continues to reject the Keystone XL pipeline expansion project, without which Canada's growing oil production cannot reach the United States. The pipeline would also provide an outlet for the growing oil production from North Dakota. The potential benefits of North American energy independence seem almost too good to be true, but they are real and they can be achieved. Between increased domestic oil production and growing supplies from Canada, a million barrels a day already, by the way, we have the opportunity to liberate ourselves from OPEC's influence, create many new energy industry jobs, and ensure greater supplies and lower prices at the pump in the years ahead. The committee, this committee has initiated legislation to remove the administration's obstacles to North American energy independence. We'll continue to fight for increased leasing on federal lands in the streamlined permitting process, and we're not going to give up on Keystone. The goal of North American energy independence is within our grasp, and it is much too valuable an opportunity to squander. And I would yield back to those. Do you want to make an opening statement, Mr. Bart? If nobody else. Um, 
I just I just want to say very quickly, Mr. Chairman, that um, back in 2005, this committee initiated what came to be known as the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Most members of the committee still serving supported that bill in the committee and on the floor, and today it's the law of the land. We incentivized in that act every feasible form of energy we thought could be produced in America, whether it was conventional or unconventional. Um, if you could uh, produce it in any shape, form, or fashion, uh, we incentivized it from, from our conventional sources, oil and gas, to uh, unconventional wind, solar, uh, biomass, sawgrass, you name it. Uh, the underlying premise was, though, that with some, of, except for the newer technologies, it would be a market-based energy policy. Because of that today, if you read this North American Energy Initiative inventory, uh, we have a possibility to be energy independent almost at any time we want to be in the next 10 to 15 years. That's an amazing story, Mr. Chairman, and this committee uh, can take pride in the fact that the, uh, the base bill that has uh, allowed that to happen uh, came out of this committee. So I'm, I'm very proud of that bill that's now the law. I'm proud of the committee, and I am looking forward to this hearing. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, today's hearing presents two different visions of an energy policy for America. One vision doubles down on the energy policies of the past. Its mantras are drill, baby, drill, and tax breaks for the oil industry. The other vision recognizes that energy is key to America's economy, national security, and environment. It supports a mix of energy sources to provide American consumers with affordable, clean energy. The choice is all of the above or oil above all, and the answer will affect the lives of every American. Not so long ago, we actually implemented an energy plan written by and for the oil industry. In 2001, President Bush and Vice President Cheney unveiled the Bush administration's energy plan written in secret with oil, coal, and energy inter industry interests. So in 2005, I examined what had happened to energy prices and dependence on foreign oil under the Bush energy policy since 2001 using data and analysis from the EIA. Under the Bush-Cheney oil industry energy plan, gasoline prices more than doubled. Crude oil prices more than doubled. The average American family spent $2,000 more each year on energy costs, and the oil companies reaped record profits. This energy plan did not benefit America's families. It did not boost our, economic, our economy or improve our national security. It certainly did not clean up pollution or address the threat of climate change. Today we're discussing another Republican energy plan that was drafted with industry, especially the oil industry. And it's a backwards-looking plan that resurrects the Bush-Cheney policies. It calls for more tax breaks for oil companies, opening new areas to drilling, and putting the states in charge of issuing drilling permits on federal lands. The Obama administration's energy policy is fundamentally different. President Obama hasn't just promised to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. He's actually done it. For the first time in decades, we are importing less than half the oil we consume. His administration's new motor vehicle standards will save more than 2 million barrels of oil per day. And U.S. domestic oil and natural gas production has reached record highs. Perhaps most important, the Obama administration has also made investing in clean energy technologies a national priority. This committee can write our nation's energy laws, but we can't amend the laws of nature. Climate change is a reality. The nations with the strongest economies will be those that recognize this fact 
and build the clean energy, energy technologies of the future. Unlike many members of this body, the Obama administration faces facts, listens to scientists, has a forward-looking vision for America, and that is why the President has invested in wind, solar, and other renewable energy sources, energy efficiency, and cleaner use of traditional energy sources. Mr. Chairman, at this point, uh, I want to yield the balance of my time uh, to Mr. Green. Thank my ranking member, Mr. Chairman, for uh, allowing me. I strongly support increasing our domestic production of oil and natural gas, and I fought this battle for years. That said, I think it's misleading to debate our energy independence based on uh, geology, technological, or economically achievable in absence of other constraints. There's always to be external factors that affect the level of production. I want to point out that according to the Energy Information Administration and their existing policies, the United States is on pace to eliminate all natural gas imports by 2020 and shrinks its net oil imports down to 38 percent. We're now at 34 percent or 42 percent from what I understand, with two-thirds of those in, uh, imports coming from friends in Canada and Mexico. The number is expected to drop even further thanks to the announced CAFE standards by the President's administration. <clears throat> We're still fairly close uh, to the North American energy independence in 2020, regardless of what we do. I share our panelists' concern about the potential regulation on things like fracking, and I'll continue to watch the administration. I support a broad outer continental shelf drilling, and I disagree with the President's five-year plan. Is, uh, likewise, I disagree with not approving the Trans-Canada Pipeline. But I also know this is the first President I've served under in 20 years who actually stood at the State of the Union and last week at the Democratic Convention talked about the success of natural gas production in our country, at least the first Democratic President. And uh, I think that's where we're going. And, uh, and I want to compliment my former chair of the committee and of uh, the Energy Bill of 2005 did expand it. My frustration is we have a bill on the floor tomorrow that will take some of that expansion away from us, including oil and gas uh, alternatives and other alternatives. So um, that's our problem we have with this Congress. We're passing a lot of messages, but not actually legislation. And I yield back my time. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh at this time, uh, I will call on each witness, and you'll be given five minutes for an opening statement. And uh, before I call on you individually, I'm just going to introduce the entire panel. First of all, uh, we have with us today Mr. Harold Hamm, who's the chairman and CEO of Continental Resources that's played a vital role in the development of the Bakken field. We have Dr. Daniel Ahn, who's the chief commodity economist at Citigroup. We have Mr. John Freeman, who is the Managing Director of E&P Equity Research at Raymond James & Associates. We have Mr. Daniel Weiss, who is the Senior Fellow for the Center for American Progress Action Fund. We have Mr. John Purcell, who is the Vice President for Wind Energy at Leco Steel Company. We have Mr. Mark Mills, who is the Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. And we have Mr. Peter Howard, who is the President and CEO of Canadian Energy Research Institute. So we have a broad uh, spectrum of interest here to testify this morning on this important uh, subject matter. And Mr. Ham, uh, I'll call on you and recognize you first for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Whitfield uh, and members of the committee. I'm very glad to be here and very honored to be speaking this morning. As uh, you said, we are a leading expert in the Bakken formation, having been there from the beginning. Continental is the largest producer of the Bakken resource in Montana and North Dakota, and also the entire Wilson Basin. Our production is about 70% oil, and you know, we're, we're known as an oil company. Also serve as an energy advisor currently to Governor Romney, but I'm not here representing any campaign, any political party. I'm just here as an American, American patriot, someone that started with nothing, one truck operation, you know, the son of a sharecropper, had 13 kids, the last of 13, built a one small one truck operation into a large leading energy company in America. 
very excited today uh, to talk about the great American promise of energy independence within this decade. For far too long, we stood under OPEC dominance as producers for some 40 years. People lost the will to look for oil in this country. They couldn't do it. Every time we uh, got to work busy, uh, you know, OPEC would turn the taps on, drown us, put us out of business. Finally got down to where nobody was looking for oil. Everybody was looking for natural gas in this country. Finally, that the day came that they didn't have the uh, excess capacity any longer that they could drown us like that so we could go back to work, and we did. And we came out with some great things, the great technology of today. And that one technology that's been developed primarily by our company and others, independent companies, over the past 15 years primarily, has been one thing, that's horizontal drilling. And as an explorationist and a geologist, I can tell you that this was a wonderful breakthrough. You know, it drowns out all the breakthroughs of the past. You know, 2D seismic, for instance, that saw a bump in production in the U.S. and the, and the world. 3D seismic uh, that, that came about, and everybody was so excited about in the early 90s. And here we are today talking about something that dwarfs all of those, and that's horizontal drilling. The ability to drill down two miles, turn right, drill two to three miles further, and hit your lapel pin if we want to. So it's that, that technology, that, that precision that's been adopted out there. And what that allows us to do, it allows us to enter another world, the, the world of immobile oil. We've been producing mobile oil. The stuff that would move to you and trapped in different reservoirs all over. And that's what we've been chasing all this time. Today, we can go after the source rocks themselves, where the oil was stored, tight rocks, heavy oil, tar sands, all of those things that we couldn't get to before. So it's an entire new world of geology that's out there waiting us. And we're able to do that successfully, repeatedly across the nation. And we've been doing that for the past 15 years, and the result is tremendous as to, as to what's happened. So we look at what that result is. 2005, we thought we were running out of natural gas. Everybody thought we were going to be about out. And we had about seven years' supply at that time, current production that would sustain us, reserves. Now we're at about 125 years. A lot of these shale resource plays that we're able to tap into natural gas cross country. But then we have a few that's oil. And what, what have we got there? Well, we've seen great, great uh, fields come on. The Bakken is certainly a good example of that. You know, with the technology that we have today, we can, we can get into that tight rock, you know, where the Bakken oil was generated and stored over time. And it's a tremendous resource. So today we're the number one natural gas producer in the world. And today we're the number two crude oil producer in the world. A lot of people don't realize that statistic. We just passed Russia in oil production. We're just slightly behind Saudi Arabia in oil production. So we get back to that old thing, supply and demand. You know, we're bringing on a lot of new supply. You'll hear people talk today about the three to five million barrels a day that we're going to increase production in before 2020. And you ask if this new energy renaissance is achievable. Hardly any of the scientists that know what, what the drill is today will say that that's not achievable because it certainly is achievable. And it's a great promise for our country. We're finally out from under OPEC dominance. And it means so much, the stability of our nation, national security, you know, the jobs, you mentioned all those things. Good things flow from American oil, and there's a tremendous amount of, and I, I'm excited to talk about all of those. I'll see my time's out. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ham. <clears throat> Dr. Ahn, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Whitfield, uh, Ranking Member Rush, and uh, Chairman Upton, and distinguished members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's American Energy Initiative hearing. My name is Daniel Ahn, and I am the Chief Commodities Economist at Citigroup in New York. Earlier this year, 
my colleagues and I published a report entitled Energy 2020, North America, the New Middle East, and I would like to take the opportunity to share and update its conclusions. North America has recently become the fastest growing hydrocarbon producer and exporter in the world, and this trend should accelerate to the end of the decade. This energy renaissance has been driven by both declining domestic consumption and the successful deployment of new technologies to extract hitherto inaccessible oil and gas resources, particularly in tight and shale rock formations using horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing techniques. These two trends, declining demand and burgeoning supply, should have dramatic consequences for national energy security and for the domestic and global economy. I will echo the chairman's opening statement and state that I estimate that new U.S. oil and gas production could add at least 200 and possibly 300 billion dollars in revenue and in turn could stimulate many hundreds of billions more in economic activity, investment, consumption, and create at least two and possibly as high as three and a half million new jobs. Furthermore, American dependence on imported oil outside of North America should shrink or even be eliminated entirely. The current account deficit, which had seen trillions of dollars pass from American consumers onto foreign oil exporters, could be slashed by two-thirds. This would strengthen the credibility of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency of choice. Global oil prices could fall by 15 or even 20 percent, Energy-intensive manufacturing industries, such as petroleum refining, petrochemicals, fertilizers, iron, steel, aluminum, smelting, all should strategically benefit. Natural gas-fueled vehicles could proliferate on American roads. Distinguished committee members, a minor industrial revolution is in the making in our heartland. This is testament to the technical ingenuity and flexibility of American workers and enterprises and the bounty of our natural resources. With that, I look forward to future discussion and questions during the rest of the hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahn. And Mr. Freeman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the members of the committee, including Chairman Upton, uh, Ranking Member Waxman, and specifically would like to thank Subcommittee Chairman Whitfield and Ranking Member Rush for holding this hearing and inviting me to testify on behalf of Raymond James. My name is John Freeman. I've worked as a part of the Energy Research Group at Raymond James since 2000. Together with my colleague Pavel Molchianov, who joins me in the room, welcome the opportunity to appear before the committee and share our team's perspectives on the progress the nation is making towards energy independence. America is already a major exporter of coal, and together with Canada, we're already self-sufficient when it comes to natural gas. And for the first time in over 50 years, there's clear visibility on how oil independence can be achieved. Many of the themes I'm going to describe today are sustainable trends driven by the private sector and they can continue for a long time even without additional policy steps. However, Congress can and should play a constructive role in accelerating these trends and supporting industry efforts along the way. The nation's all-time peak for petroleum imports was in 2005 at 13.5 million barrels a day. By 2011, imports were down to 9.7 million barrels a day. That reduction in imports was almost evenly balanced between rising domestic production and declining consumption. And we believe imports can disappear entirely by as early as 2020. All of you are aware of the unprecedented boom in unconventional drilling activity across the U.S. This game-changing trend first materialized in the natural gas industry and led to the U.S. becoming the largest natural gas producer in the world. In the oil industry, the unconventional boom began a bit later but we think the real inflection point is now upon us. This year alone, we project a supply increase of nearly one million barrels a day, about as much as the prior two years put together. In fact, we forecast the U.S. will become the largest oil producer in the world before the end of this decade. Despite the impressive production growth the industry is accomplishing, it has not come without its share of challenges. One of these will be difficult for this committee to do anything about, and that's what we refer to as the graying of the oil patch. The average U.S. petroleum engineer is 50 years old. Some of the most active drilling areas, such as the Bakken in North Dakota, have widespread labor shortages across the spectrum. 
it's no surprise that North Dakota has the lowest unemployment rate of any state. The other two constraints are issues that Congress has more influence over. One is the development of pipeline infrastructure, and while very few pipeline projects will achieve the political notoriety of Keystone, permitting bottlenecks can still slow down the process, especially as it pertains to federal lands. The growth in drilling activity in recent years has been much more visible on private and state lands rather than federal lands, which reflects the more stringent regulatory scrutiny associated with federal lands. The challenge here is to balance prudent environmental protection with the industry's needs. If I turn to demand, the nation's oil demand began to fall well before the onset of the financial crisis in 2008. Between 1992 and 2005, demand was up every single year except one. Since 2005, demand has fallen every year except one. There are four long-term drivers that, in our view, will result in a sustained decline in U.S. oil demand. The first driver is ongoing improvement in fuel economy. Between 2006 and 2011, the increase in average fuel economy of actual passenger car sales improved more in absolute terms than it had in the 15 years combined prior to that. Second, there's an ongoing decline in vehicle miles traveled. The use of public transport, greater reliance on Internet commerce, the fact that the number of automobiles per household peaked in 2007, due in part to demographics, are just some of the factors driving this trend. The final two reasons involve a shift from oil to natural gas in the petrochemical industry as well as in transportation. The cost advantages of the U.S. chemical industry compared to its overseas competitors helps explain why many new chemical plants are in development and oil-based feedstocks have been cut in half since 2005. Transportation is another emerging arena for natural gas usage due to the cost advantage over oil. In conclusion, America is blessed with an abundance of natural resources. We're the largest producer of natural gas in the world, the second largest producer of coal, and in the next several years will become the largest oil producer in the world. The future has never been brighter for achieving energy independence. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Freeman. And uh, Mr. Weiss, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Whitfield. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Rush and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify today. Congress must not ignore climate science when developing energy policies. Promoting an energy independence plan that increases carbon pollution is like setting your house on fire to stay warm. It may work at first, but the long-term consequences are horrendous. Any North American energy independence plan must reduce carbon pollution, too. This year, the polluted climate struck back with the worst U.S. drought in over 50 years and the third hottest summer ever measured. And the drought has cost us at least $5 billion in crop damage so far. The Obama administration's all-the-above energy strategy includes both pollution reductions and domestic energy production. It modernized fuel economy standards, which will save drivers $1 per gallon. We cut carbon pollution from cars and invested in clean energy technologies. Renewable electricity generation has doubled. Domestic oil production is the highest in 15 years, and imports are the lowest. Natural gas production is the highest ever. 75,000 new oil and gas jobs have been created in the last three years. To build on these successes, we must continue to invest in renewable electricity, energy efficiency, and clean vehicles and fuels so that our companies can compete with those in other nations. Without incentives, financiers will invest elsewhere, effectively outsourcing clean energy jobs to China and other nations with more supportive policies. Domestic oil production benefits our economy and security. Fewer imports will reduce our trade deficit. But more domestic production won't do much to lower prices at the pump because gasoline prices are mostly based on oil prices that are set on a world market controlled by the OPEC cartel. The Associated Press tested whether more U.S. drilling would lower gasoline prices by analyzing three decades of U.S. production and price data. EPA found, and I quote, no statistical correlation between how much oil comes out of U.S. wells and the price at the pump, unquote. Canada is oil dependent, yet it had the same high gasoline prices this year as the U.S. did. Contrary to some claims, expansion of drilling into protected uh, public lands and waters would have little impact on gasoline prices. However, such policies would increase carbon and other pollution because many oil and natural gas production techniques generate significant emissions. 
In addition, there's a proposal now to let states decide whether to allow oil drilling in National Park Service units and other public lands within their borders. This tempts states to sanction drilling to generate oil revenues rather than safeguard the natural resources of these lands for their owners, who are the American people. The New York Times, the New York Times noted, and I quote, states tend to be interested mainly in resource development, unquote. Yesterday, the Center for American Progress released data highlighting 30 national park units that could have future oil and gas drilling, including the Flight 93 Memorial in Pennsylvania and Everglades National Park in Florida. These places would be more vulnerable to oil drilling if federal oversight is eliminated in favor of more relaxed state rules. A columnist for Field and Stream magazine warned that state control of energy development on public lands would devastate outdoor activities. Quote, when it comes to the future of public hunting and fishing, fewer proposals could be more frightening, unquote. The proposal to build the Keystone XL pipeline won't increase our energy security much either. A significant portion of the Canadian tar sands oil that would flow to Gulf Coast refineries and be refined and exported as diesel or gasoline. And the increase in production of energy intensive Canadian tar sands oil made possible by the pipeline would add even more carbon pollution to our overburdened atmosphere. In fact, Raymond James and Associates John Freeman is a representative of them, predicts a significant oil production increase in the coming years without any expansion of drilling into protected places or weakening of environmental safeguards. And quote from their report, by 2020, based on domestic oil production, growth in biofuels, and declines in demand, we expect net imports to reach essentially zero, unquote. To become more energy independent while reducing carbon pollution, we must increase investments in efficiency and clean electricity, vehicles, and fuels. We can pay for these investments by ending $2.4 billion of annual special tax breaks for the five largest oil companies, BP, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, and Shell. These five companies made $60 billion in profits in the first half of 2012 and a record $137 billion in 2011. The money from these tax breaks would be better invested in the clean energy technologies of the future that will make us both energy independent and cut carbon pollution. That would lead to real energy independence. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Weiss. And uh, Mr. Purcell, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and subcommittee members. Uh, my name is John Purcell, and I serve as Vice President of Wind Energy for Leco Steel. I appreciate the opportunity to speak briefly today about America's wind power contribution to a secure and affordable national energy portfolio. I would especially like to focus on the impact on Leco Steel and the U.S. wind energy sector due to the impending expiration of the Renewable Energy Production Tax Credit, the PTC. We at Leco Steel feel it is imperative for the PTC to be extended in its full form as soon as possible, as included in the Family and Business Tax Cut Certainty Act that was passed on a strong bipartisan basis by the Senate Finance Committee by a vote of 19 to 5. Leco Steel is a wholly owned subsidiary of O'Neill Steel, the largest privately held metals distribution company in the United States. Headquartered in Lyle, in a western suburb of Chicago, Leco Steel is a carbon, high-strength, low-alloy steel plate distributor and processor serving the United States, Mexico, and South America from seven locations throughout these regions. We have distribution facilities in Portage, Indiana, Oshkosh, Wisconsin, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Chattanooga, Tennessee, and Fort Worth, Texas. Leco Steel first began delivering steel plates and fabricated plate products to the wind industry in 2004. Revenue from the wind energy industry now accounts for nearly 40% of our company's revenues. The wind business for Leco has become a keystone of our overall business and a driver for development of our company overall. Leco Steel has provided over 500,000 tons of steel plates to 12 tower manufacturing facilities in 12 states across the U.S. 500,000 tons of steel in the last six years that didn't exist, a market that didn't exist before 2004 for us, most of which has been built in the last eight years. The PTC has helped us to expand our company in the wind industry and into other new markets and has helped us weather the recent economic downturn. Since the early development of our wind business, we have hired over 70 people at my company to help maintain the growth strategies that we have planned for our company. In the past six years where there has been certainty of a PTC, our wind business and the wind industry overall have been important drivers of economic growth. Of the 12 fa tower factories mentioned above, 10 of these factories did not exist before 2002. Taking an average of 250, excuse me, 
250 employees per factory. That is 2,500 new good paying jobs that were created in a very short amount of time within our supply chain alone. This does not take into account the thousands of additional jobs that exist in the supply chain that supplies goods and services to each of these 12 factories. Because of the PTC, the U.S. wind industry has seen tremendous growth and innovation has become an American success story. Overall, wind energy capacity has grown to over 50 gigawatts, which is enough energy to power over 13 million American homes. Iowa and South Dakota now get roughly near 20% of their electricity from wind generation alone. The wind industry has generated investment upward of $20 billion annually and created 75,000 jobs. Since the PTC was last allowed to expire, there were approximately only 25% domestic content in each wind turbine that was erected on average. Today, the average is over 65% domestic content in each installed turbine. And wind power is more affordable than ever, with costs falling 90% since the 1980s to 5 to, 5 to 7 cents per kilowatt hour today. With such a positive impact on communities across the country, it is no surprise that the PTC has enjoyed widespread bipartisan support. One example of this support can be seen in the list of 113 co-sponsors, including 27 Republicans, of H.R. 3307, a bill that would extend the PTC through 2016. Another PTC extension bill on the Senate side, S-2201, was introduced on a bipartisan basis and there is strong support by both Republican and Democratic governors as well for a PTC extension. With the PTC extension uncertainty, many of LECO's expansion plans are at risk. There have been high-level discussions to increase the amount of steel plate capacity for the wind business in the coming few years. However, those discussions have now gone silent as there needs to be business case certainty to move forward with such huge capital investments. In similar fashion over the years, many plans to increase wind tower production in the U.S. has been scrapped due to uncertainty caused by on-again, off-again nature of the PTC. As a result, the wind industry, industry as a whole is already seeing massive layoffs. Many, plan to, many plans to add existing facilities or invest in new facilities are on indefinite hold or, again, have been scrapped altogether. Industry-wide, 37,000 jobs will be lost if the PTC is not extended immediately. It's my opinion that the supply chain was built for the wind industry and billions of dollars were invested in it because companies expected a long-term PTC that would allow for stable growth in the wind business for many years to come. Major factories have been established from coast to coast and many North American headquarters have been established in such cities as Portland, Chicago, and Denver. Without an extension of the PTC, all these assets are at premium risk or being shuttered or downsized dramatically. With an immediate extension of the PTC, the development and construction of these turbines can continue as planned. The tens of thousands of jobs that can be created with this extension will allow the wind industry not only to continue to be a leader in job creation, but help secure our nature's energy future by diversifying America's energy mix and locking in stable power prices over a long time frame. The PTC is also crucial for regaining our nation's leadership in new technology and innovation that will help keep our economy competitive. The wind industry is on the verge of becoming competitive without the PTC, but failing to extend it immediately would prevent us from finishing the job. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Purcell. Mr. Mills, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank, the, thank you to the committee for the, uh, the opportunity and the honor of uh, testifying before you today. Uh, as you know, I'm Mark Mills, a senior fellow with the Manhattan Institute. I've spent almost all of my career as a technologist, as a practitioner, uh, an analyst, and fundamentally in recent decade, a forecaster of technologies. We're at an interesting turning point technologically in the energy arena that no one expected us to arrive at at any time in the last five decades. But let me put the co into context, if I may, the idea of energy independence that we've been talking about since 1973 from the first Arab oil embargo. The idea of energy independence is not one of isolationism for the United States. I would suggest that we consider independence in the same context as we're interdependent of food and agriculture. The United States is the single largest supplier of grains to the world. We provide 40% of the world's trade in grains. That provides America with all of the associated revenue benefits, trade, jobs benefits. It's of enormous value to this country. Technology is now doing for the American energy and fuel sector what happened to the agricultural sector. 
It's a revolution of profound proportions. It suggests something that can be done that we have never considered for decades. It's a complete reversal of the energy paradigms that were put in place and what formed policies for the last four decades. These are the paradigms that everybody knows were based on the idea of shortages and limits and rising imports. We can now think realistically, as you've heard from the number of the witnesses this morning, we can think realistically not just in terms of a dramatic continual increase on hydrocarbon production in the United States. We could accelerate and incent that and become a net energy exporter to the world and become, within less than two decades, probably within a decade, the world's largest supplier of hydrocarbons and fuels, just as we're now the world's largest supplier of, fuel, of food. Uh, you've already heard from uh, a number of witnesses, and there are at least a half dozen excellent reports, including that from City and Raymond James, that point out that we are in that context on track to generating millions of jobs from this kind of trajectory and probably trillions of dollars of net economic benefit to our economy. All of these analyses have been done in the context of business as usual. If we leave the industry alone, it will continue to generate these benefits. I would like to suggest this morning that that's not adequate to the times. It's not adequate to the task or the opportunity. I know that we have, uh, in the general political discourse, made fun of the idea of drill, baby, drill. But it is a practical reality that the infrastructure of the hydrocarbon industry is now capable of generating more jobs and more economic benefits to the U.S. economy than any single activity we could incent in the entire economy. We could literally drill, but I would expand this, to drill, dig, build, and ship our way out of the economic and jobs crisis that we're in right now by recognizing the technological and resource realities that are now in place. No one expected this. And any time in the last 40 years, nobody expected this even five years ago. The reality here, of course, is that this comes at a terrific time for the United States. We are no longer the primary energy consumer of the world, and none of the any increase in energy demand, in fact, most likely zero energy demand growth occurs in the United States over the next decade, net demand growth. All of the net energy demand growth in the world is occurring outside of the United States, which is a complete reversal of where we were in the 1970s. The world will add to its demand over the next two decades the equivalent of adding two United States worth of energy demand. And it will occur without regard to anything that occurs in the United States within our borders or in North America. We now have the opportunity to help fuel that hungry world. 85% of the world's energy is currently in hydrocarbons, and essentially all of the, or majority of all the growth in demand will come from hydrocarbons over the next two decades. There's a very significant role for non-hydrocarbons, but the majority will be hydrocarbons. So the United States is sitting here at an interesting turning point. We could uh, see this enormous opportunity to produce and fuel the world and generate millions of jobs in America, and generate trillions of dollars of net economic benefit, or we could choose not to do so. I, I would suggest that the issue that should be considered is not how do we not impede the industry from continuing to bring this very happy circumstance of becoming the world's fastest growing hydrocarbon province. How do we accelerate that? How do we accelerate those economic benefits, the benefits to the world, to our economy, and fundamentally reset the geopolitics of the energy economy for the entire world? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mills. And Mr. Howard, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Peter Howard, and I am President and CEO of the Canadian Energy Research Institute located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. The Canadian Energy Research Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute specializing in the energy economics of energy production, transportation, and consumption sectors. The central goal of Siri is to bring the insights of scientific research, economic analysis, and practical experience to the attention of government policymakers, business sector decision makers, the media, and the general public. Siri is funded by the Government of Canada, the Government of the Province of Alberta, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, and the Small Explorers and Producers Association. Siri has published several reports that deal with the economic analysis and short to medium term forecasts of hydrocarbon production from the Canadian provinces and territories, including conventional oil, conventional gas, coal bed methane, unconventional gas, oil sands, LNG, and natural gas liquids. These reports are all available on Siri's website and are the basis of my comments today. With respect to liquid hydrocarbons, in 2011, uh, Canada's average daily production was made up of the following. From Western Canada, light crude was 562,000 barrels, condensate 128,000, conventional heavy 422,000, 
Upgraded bitumen or SCO at 846,000, non-upgraded bitumen at 759,000. And from Eastern Canada, primarily Newfoundland, conventional light at 272,000 for a total of 2,989,000 barrels per day average. In 2011, Canada's average daily exports was 2,138,000, of which 98% of those volumes went to the United States. Canada's conventional oil production, light and heavy, peaked in the mid-70s at 2.2 million barrels per day and has seen a steady decline since that point until very recently. In 2010 and 2011, the year-over-year -year production rate actually increased. The reason? Applying horizontal drilling technology to old oil fields to access bypassed oil and increase recoverable oil percentage. During those years, the numbers of oil-directed wells increased from 1,647 wells in 2008 to 4,339 wells in 2011, with horizontal wells being 60% of the total. Ceres conventional oil sand oil model is forecasting a conservative increase in conventional oil of 200,000 barrels per day by 2015 and an optimi optimistic in increase of 300,000 barrels. The Alberta oil sands currently produce on average 1.618 million barrels per day with 60% sourced from mining operations and 40% from in situ operations. Production ramp ups and debottlenecking de efforts over the next two years will expand production to 2.2 million barrels per day. An additional 408,000 barrels per day is scheduled to be connected from projects that are currently under construction and due on stream in and, in and about 2015. Additional volumes of 1.3 million barrels per day and another 1.3 million barrels per day on top of that are either have their regulatory approval or are waiting for their regular regulatory approval. And on top of all that, there's a further 1 million per barrels per day from projects that have been announced that have not gone before the regular. Total potential from the oil sands is around 5.3 million barrels per day. In other words, there's 2.5 million barrels or five pipelines of production that is considered landlocked and is looking for a pathway to either a, an existing market or a new market. The current export capacity of pipelines from the WCSB from an operational point of view is 3.45 million barrels per day. Add to this two projects that Enbridge Pipelines is currently undertaking to increase capacity on lines 67 and 61 of totaling 200,000 barrels per day. Total export capacity by 2015 will, and forward will be around 3.65 million barrels per day. In 2012, the Trans Mountain Pipeline System connecting Alberta to Vancouver was 60% oversubscribed. By 2016, Siri is forecasting that the export pipelines connecting Alberta to the United States will be approaching an oversubscribed situation. Some possible relief from railway, railways is envisaged by transporting upwards of 200,000 barrels per day to market, which would shift that point to about 2018. There are three possible pipeline projects that are on the books, the Keystone XL, Trans Mountain Expansion, and the Northern Gateway. In addition to those, there are three other proposals. The first one is Enbridge's Line 9 to reverse that and change the flow direction from Sarnia, Ontario to Montreal, Quebec. Total volume would be 240,000 barrels per day, and this would be conventional crude sourced out of Alberta and Saskatchewan. TransCanada has also proposed converting one of the Canadian mainline gas pipelines over to oil and bitumen service. This would connect Western Canada to all of the Eastern Canadian refineries, including the Irving Refinery in New Brunswick. The Port of Churchill, Manitoba is currently ice-free for nine months of the year, and this is being investigated as a potential pipe pipeline connection and tanker port. I see that my time has come up, so I will uh, belay my comments with regard to natural gas and secede to, to the chairman. Thank you. Well, Mr. Howard, thanks very much, and I want to thank all of you for your testimony. Uh, the testimony was quite enlightening, and uh, when you think about a few years ago, as has been said, we all were sort of wringing our hands about being able to meet the energy demands not only of our country, but the increasing energy uh, demands around the world. And to hear this optimistic testimony today is uh, something I think all of us can feel very good about. Uh, Dr. Ahn, you even mentioned the word a minor uh, industrial revolution. Uh, would you just elaborate on that a little bit for me? I, I love that term, minor industrial revolution. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I would be happy to. Um, indeed, uh, the 
scale and the promise uh, to our economy, which is still struggling uh, to recover from the aftermath of the 2007-2008 uh, recession, uh, is uh, staggering uh, enough that uh, uh, industrial revolution uh, might be the appropriate phrase uh, to put it. Um, as I mentioned, um, the, we are seeing 200 to 300 billion dollars in activity just from the oil and gas revenue alone. But because our economy is still substantially far away from uh, what it has the potential uh, to produce and the number of jobs that it can potentially support, um, this energy revolution uh, can serve as that trigger, as that stimulus uh, to push our economy back uh, toward or even beyond uh, potential output. And how many new jobs did you estimate maybe by the end of the deca decade? Uh, yes, uh, the specific estimates um, are uh, 2 to 3.3 million jobs. About one uh, would be in the energy and the manufacturing sector, and then the remainder uh, would uh, come from multiplier effects, as economists would term it, um, as this new uh, uh, energy boom ripples through the rest of the economy, creates virtual cycles, uh, virtuous cycles um, of consumption, investment. And, and did you or Mr. Freeman make any estimates on the amount that we could reduce our trade deficit by the end of the decade? Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, Raymond James has something, but our estimates, uh, my estimate was for the U.S. current account deficit um, to be reduced uh, by two-thirds. Mr. Freeman? Uh, we had, we looked uh, a couple of years ago, half of your trade deficit was importing oil. Obviously, if you're no longer having to import oil by 2020, then you're looking at a meaningful reduction in that trade deficit. Right. And, uh, you know, the president uh, has makes, makes the comment frequently that oil production has gone up since he's been president, which is actually true. And, uh, but it certainly hasn't gone up as a result of any affirmative government program, but I think that you would agree with me, Mr. Tram, that this has been generated because of private capital, people willing to invest their capital, their, take the risk. Uh, there has not been any government program that has assisted in this, has there? No, actually it's uh, been done actually in spite of, you know, what's going on here in Washington. Uh, uh, this this thing has uh, taken about 20 years. Uh, it was led perhaps by George Mitchell and the Barnett. It's taken, you know, uh, a lot of us were engaged uh, with highly deviated drilling under the cities and actual directional wells even in the 70s. So it's, mm -hmm. it goes a long ways back, but, you know, it's been brought on yeah. by the private sector entirely. Well, now, uh, the President's made some comments and have others that have sort of left the impression that our reserves, our known reserves, are rather small. <clears throat> and I know that the <clears throat> SEC has certain rules on what you can uh, book as reserves. Would you elaborate on that issue a little bit, the known reserves, the reserve issue? Yeah, I'd like to. He makes a statement there's, you know, the U.S. has only 2% of the uh, world's reserves. and Actually, our production is about 12% of daily production in the world, so huge disconnect here uh, in the way that the U.S. calculates reserves and the rest of the world. We have what's uh, known as a five-year rule that it's like the Bakken. We're going to be drilling wells there and developing that at least 15 years, uh, probably 25 years uh, from now to fully develop it, yet we can not book anything beyond five years that we can drill beyond five years. And even though we're in a continuous, the largest continuous oil deposit uh, found in North America, uh, and basically the rock is the same through <coughs> a lot of it, mm -hmm. if it's not uh, right against what we're drilling, we can't claim it as direct offsets, even though the rock is much the same, 20 miles away, 40 miles away, 80 miles away. Uh, we, we can't uh, we can't claim it. So. so you have great certainty that it's there, but from a financial standpoint, you simply cannot claim it. Yeah, I'd say absolute geologic certainty, and it's been proven. It's just uh, 
due to the rules, we can't claim it. We know last night I was looking on the, or a few days ago, Department of Energy website and the 1705 loan guarantee program under the DOE website said they create 1,175 new jobs at a t cost of $12.8 million of taxpayer dollars per job. And I think about the contrast of what's going on in the oil and natural gas fields. Uh, Anyway, my time's expired, and Mr. Rush, I recognize you for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, very interesting panels uh, so far. Uh, we keep hearing how the Obama administration has somehow implemented policies that are hostile to the oil and gas industries, uh, <clears throat> although I would argue that the facts would indicate that those industries are actually uh, have been not happened but aided and helped uh, in, in terms of us experiencing the kind of boom that <clears throat> uh, the witnesses have spoken to uh, <clears throat> so far. And uh, my question is to Mr. Weiss or, and Mr. Purcell, do either of you agree that, or do both of you agree that the Obama administration is hostile to the oil and gas industries? And um, what evidence would you point to uh, to support your argument? Uh, thank you, Mr. Rush. Um, first, let me just, uh, I want to address something that Mr. Uh, Whitfield, uh, Chairman Whitfield just asked about, which is, has there been government support for oil development on private lands? And in fact, I believe in Mr. Ham's written statement, he talks about the value of the tax treatment of investments in drilling, where they get a, a tax break for intangible drilling costs. And I would personally classify that as a form of government support. Um, now, to answer your question, I think the only uh, are some in the oil industry may argue that uh, the administration has been hostile to the oil industry because they have issued new standards for worker safety and environmental safety on oil rigs in the wake of the BP oil disaster. Um, I think that's an incredibly uh, positive development, and in fact, the predictions of all the uh, oil growth that uh, uh, Raymond James and uh, Citigroup have made all assume that those new rules are going to be implemented, yet we're going to have this explosion in oil production, yet with uh, the production of which offshore is going to be much safer for the workers and for the environment. So I would see that as a, as a plus of what we've done. Mm -hmm. The other thing that um, the administration is focused on is eliminating uh, tax breaks, some of which go back to 1916, that benefit the oil industry that were appropriate at the time that the oil industry was new and starting out, um, but now is unnecessary. And I would argue that the $2.4 billion that goes to the big five oil companies in tax breaks every year could be better spent on things like uh, um, exp uh, sorry, uh, extending the production tax credit for wind energy, which is a new industry in the way that oil was new 100 years ago. Right. I want to, Mr. Porcel, you want to try uh, your hand in this, please? Uh, I can. Um, I, I can't speak as much to the oil and gas industry uh, in Mr. Obama's uh, uh, position on that as I can his position uh, in carrying on uh, the production tax credit for renewables, including... Yeah, the, let me ask you this question then. Sure. Why should Congress invest in renewable um, energy and wind in particular? And what are the benefits in terms of decreasing our reliance on foreign oil as well as in, cre as in creating jobs and putting Americans back to work? Yes, sir. I think the, you know, part of my testimony um, lends uh, to that policy and the continuation of the production tax credit. Um, we've created over uh, 75,000 jobs in a very short amount of time, and 37,000 of those are in manufacturing jobs of which companies that, of which I serve. Um, we've had uh, $15 billion of private investment in the wind industry over the, over, on average over the last four years. So there's a tremendous amount of private investment uh, in the wind industry as well. Um, however, with uncertainty with the PTC, both those manufacturing jobs and that investment is at, at risk today. In fact, uh, most of the developers uh, of wind uh, farms and wind turbines 
um, aren't investing money for next year because of the of the impending expiration of the PTC. So um, as recently as yesterday, there was another announcement, another one of uh, the customers that I serve um, having to close their wind tower factory in Columbus, Nebraska, um, and the freight of Washington. And, and last week, um, DMI Industries announced closing of three facilities, of two of which are in the United States, one in North Dakota and one in Oklahoma, um, because of the uncertainty of the PTC. So, How many jobs are affected with the closures? Uh, with those those th five factories um, at peak employment two years ago were roughly 1,500 jobs mm -hmm. um, in those factories alone, and those are just two examples recently in the last two weeks of plant closures due to the uncertainty of the PTC. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, I would say uh, again, in, uh, part of my testimony that I feel like we have bipartisan support uh, from both parties mm -hmm. uh, that believe in the production tax credit. We you know we we think that um, now's the time. It's it's beyond time. And uh, so we appreciate the president's support uh, of the PTC very publicly. And um, it was something, quite frankly, um, that uh, President Bush uh, extended back in his term as well. So we, we feel like both presidents, or recent presidents, have uh, acknowledged the, the, the benefit of the production tax credit and of the wind industry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Barton, for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, couple observations and then I'll ask some questions. You know, we some of the um, opponents of our current market-based energy policy keep harping on the fact of uh, the scarcity issue. Um, and the chairman in his questions asked a, a question about the reserve base to Mr. Ham. I just want to point out that uh, Texas which except for a few years in the 70s and 80s has been the number one oil producing state in the country. Alaska, when Prudhoe Bay was in full production, was number one for, I think, 10 or 15 years. But Texas has averaged somewhere between a million and two million barrels of oil production a day for over 100 years. It, Texas by itself has produced somewhere between 40 and 50 billion barrels of oil in the last 100 years. And one of the most most prolific fields in Texas is the Permian Basin, which has been in production since the 1920s. And because of the new technologies in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing and, and also some water flood projects, Permian Basin this year will produce as much oil as it's ever produced in any given year. You know, if you look at what's called proven reserves, which is recoverable today at today's prices and today's technology, the United States proven reserves are 20 to 30 billion. But if you look at recoverable reserves, which it's technologically possible that we know the oil is there, it's in the trillions. It's in the trillions. And in Mr. Ham's home state, I assume you're from North Dakota. Is that correct? Well, I'm sure there are a lot, but I'm actually from Oklahoma. You know, from Oklahoma. <laughs> but your, your oil company is in North yes. Dakota. North Dakota, 10 years ago, was producing three or 4,000 barrels a day. I mean, it was in the thousands. In the near future, North Dakota is going to produce over a million barrels of oil a day. You know, so it's not a necessarily about proven. It's about recoverable. And when, when you look at the statistics of what's out there, uh, the chairman's home state, Chairman Upton of Michigan, is going to be a huge producer of natural gas. And Michigan is not noted to be a, an energy production state. But in the next 10 years, Michigan is going to be producing probably a billion cubic feet of natural gas a day. It's just, it's just stunning. So I just wanted to, to, to put that on the record. I want to ask Mr. Purcell, who I have great sympathy for, you're here talking about the, uh, the wind credit, I believe. And in the 2005 Energy Policy Act, I supported the inclusion from the Ways and Means Committee of the wind credit that, that you talked about. However, today I don't. And the reason is because seven years ago, wind was an emerging technology and we didn't have a lot of wind production. Well, today we do. And the cost per kilowatt hour of wind 
is very competitive now, less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, you know, in Texas, where we have an intrastate deregulated market, we have wind projects which are selling power into the grid at negative prices because they get the 2.3 cent wind tax credit. So I believe that wind power is now a, a uh, conventional source and a mature industry, although it's still growing, which is a good thing, and it's, it's not acceptable to spend a billion to a billion and a half dollars a year uh, on on tax credits. What's your response to that? <clears throat> like, I appreciate your, your comments, and um, I, I can't speak to the negative pricing. I'm a steel guy, so <laughs> uh, you'd have to ask somebody a lot smarter than me about that as far as the electricity going back in from western Texas. However, I do know that your state um, did provide a leadership uh, we role have a in wind under Governor Bush, um, started the wind initiative in the state of Texas, and uh, today you have the most installed megawatts of any state in the, in the country, um, over 10,000 megawatts of installed power, getting 8% of your electricity generation in Texas from wind power. So it has been a wonderful thing. We appreciate your support in 2005, and, and uh, sorry you don't feel the same way today. However, uh, as a steel provider uh, to this industry, um, and in, in the, as a, I, I, speaking, I, I think, from the industry as a whole, we don't feel like we've completely finished the job and we need the production tax credit um, extended um, for a certain period of time to help us finish the job. We have brought down the cost of, of wind power um, to where it is competitive over a 20-year power purchase agreement. It's the only power that I know of that can offer a utility a sure price of, of, of fuel for 20 years because, um, of course, the wind is free. Um, so, you know, in my estimation as a steel guy, um, I am watching my customers laying off folks all across the country, and um, I won't be providing steel plates to any of those factories again. So I can't answer, again, your question about negative pricing. Um, I'll leave that to uh, someone else. But uh, with regard to the need for the production tax credit to continue the manufacturing renaissance, uh, much like was talked about by my colleague down the table, um, we feel like we also have had uh, a major manufacturing renaissance in the wind power industry, and uh, those jobs are at risk and being lost today. Uh, Mr. Barton, thank you. My time. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, at this time, uh, this time I recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, Mr. Hahn, Mr. Freeman, both of you note how increased domestic production would bring down the price of oil in the next 10 years. Yet <clears throat> petroleum and gasoline prices are set by a complex mix of factors, including global crude prices, increased world demand, refining capacity, uh, maintenance schedules, gasoline imports, prescription, prescriptive fuel mandates, and geopolitical events. Unfortunately, these factors are beyond our effective control. Canada is a net, net exporter and an actual oil independent nation, but gasoline prices in Canada rise and falls in accordance with the world events. Can you please walk me through the basis on why you made your projection that, uh, uh, that it would actually be able to lower prices if we just did increase more in the United States? Now, I agree, if you put more oil on the world market, you know, the, the price will be more flexible, just like every once in a while when the president decides to release it from the SPRO. Uh, we'll see some flexibility over a few weeks, but it goes back. Can you tell me why you think that uh, our gasoline prices will go down if we uh, produce more domestically? Either one of you or both of you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Congressman, uh, for that question. I'll be happy to elaborate. Um, as I mentioned uh, in uh, uh, my remarks, uh, we are estimating that uh, global oil prices could fall by 15 to 20 percent thanks to the combination of uh, both new supply um, and declining consumption domestically. Just to break that down a little, uh, we see about 14 percent of that um, uh, come from new supply um, and about another 3 percent uh, of that come from declining consumption. Um, but this is uh, Ceridus paribus, um, all else equal, when you so correctly mentioned that global oil prices are set by a multitude um, of factors, much of this um, outside, of, um, outside of our borders. Um, that said, um, the, uh, both the secular decline in consumption domestically um, is part of a broader 
um, movement of uh, uh, declining consumption um, around the world uh, in response to historically high prices uh, during the latter part of the past decade, um, even in uh, countries such as China, um, as part of their 12th um, uh, economic five-year plan, um, have made improving their domestic energy uh, efficiency um, a key goal. So we will be seeing um, a both a broad trend of declining um, uh, consumption um, around the entire world at the same time as we see not just um, a burgeoning supply coming from the U.S. and North America, um, but also from the Middle East, from Africa, from Australia, um, from Brazil, um, uh, even um, uh, the, re the resurgence of supply from traditional sources such as Iraq, Russia, et cetera. So um, uh, the, the United States is at the heart and at the forefront um, of this revolution, but it is a global revolution uh, in which uh, we should see uh, substantially lower prices. Mr. Freeman, I only have less than two minutes. Do you, do you basically agree with that, that it's both increased production, particularly not in just the United States, but potential in other countries, but also substantial reduction in demand? Yes, it's definitely a combination of both. Um, you know, obviously it was, it was easier to drive down the natural gas price because natural gas was not a fungible global commodity in North America. Um, and there's a reason you've got, you know, nearly decade low natural gas prices. It does take longer for oil uh, because it is a global fungible commodity. Um, you probably have noticed, you know, your West Texas intermediate price is a good $17 less than what the global oil price is right now. So we are seeing an impact from the rapid supply growth we've got in this country. Um, we are expecting the, uh, the oil price here uh, to drop a, a good $30. Um, now, there will be times when OPEC may respond and cut production, and that will temporarily pop up the price again. Okay. Let but, me cut you off because yeah. I only have 45 seconds left, um, and I have a number of other questions. So, but, you know, not only production, which I support expanded domestic production, offshore and onshore, but, uh, and, but also what Canada possibly brings in. But one of the issues I have, and I had a great trip, by the way, to Alberta, uh, a couple of weeks ago to see the oil sands and the success that they're having. We would like to get that to our five refineries, but a million barrels a day sounds great. But the district I represent, we use over a million barrels a day in our five refineries. So I don't think there's a panacea here because uh, we expand ours. Maybe if we got that cheap West Texas oil to Philadelphia, they wouldn't be closing their refineries. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know I'm out of time, but uh, obviously I have a lot of other questions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This time, I recognize the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Pompeo. Five. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hammett, it wasn't very long ago that there was this theory of peak oil. We're about out of this stuff. All of American energy policy, really for the last 25, 30 years under both parties, was premised on, on that notion. Any validity to the fact that we are, that you're wrong, that what we've heard from these economists today is wrong, and that um, we, we do have this challenge in front of us in the near term? Well, there were several believers in peak oil. I, I wasn't in that group. Uh, so we had, uh, you know, there's, there's still some uh, people, I guess, that may be uh, talking about peak oil. But, you know, frankly, it's a, it's a matter of supply and development, and, and we're seeing so many other uh, plays, oil plays across the U.S. today that, uh, you know, it's almost too, too many to quantify at this time. Uh, but the the big ones that we have, of course, the Bach and uh, Eagleford, and uh, that's adding so much uh, supply here in the U.S. Plus, uh, natural gas uh, production across the U.S. brings a lot of liquids with it as well. You bet. Don't forget the Mississippi Shale in Kansas Fourth Congressional. That, that's correct. Yeah. Mississippi is a big uh, play. Absolutely, uh, uh, Mr. Purcell. Yeah, I heard you talk about the wind production tax credit created thirty thousand seven thousand jobs. Um, and you talk about an expectation of its continuation. I, I find that very surprising. We've known for a long time when this thing was going to expire. It's a date certain. It's in current law. Uh, do, do you regret having built your business model on the assumption that politicians would extend that production tax credit? Because, because now you're talking about laying folks off, and you turn it back to us and say, gosh, you all need to extend that so my people don't get laid off. Well, you made the decision. You made the decision to hire those folks based on law you knew was expiring. So I'm, I'm interested in whether you have any regrets about having built your business model around that. 
No, I, 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 quite the contrary. I'm, I'm, it's served us very well. We've, uh, we've grown, been able to grow our, our company in other ways. Um, quite frankly, uh, you know, I, I see here before you with regard to the production tax credit, but our company um, serves these other industries that are being talked about as well today, and we're, we're, we're actually uh, greenfielding a plant south of Fort Worth, Texas. We're going to spend $10 million down there developing in that area for both for wind and oil and gas. So, you know, the, specific to the production tax credit, yes, um, there is an expectation that, that that would be continued to allow the wind energy, uh, wind industry to continue the work that we're doing. Um, the, the turbines are getting more efficient. They're, the towers are getting taller, which is good for me. Uh, more steel under the turbine. Uh, the blades are getting, the technology is getting better. Um, a lot of things with regard to siting and, and wildlife are getting better. So everything that we're doing in the wind industry, I feel, is, is beneficial. However, much like uh, going back to 1916, we talked about subsidies for oil. Um, it took a long time for the, the country's yep. oil to get as well. So it's, I, it's something that we feel like we need just a few more, for a few more years on. I, I appreciate that. I, I went back and looked at the record from the 80s and 90s. The industry has said just a couple more years for an awfully long time. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mills, you talked about uh, policies we could do to, to exploit this enormous renaissance. What's the most important thing we could do as a federal policy matter? Uh, we've now got 10 agencies investigating fracking. The last time 10 agencies investigated something and did nothing, none of us were here. Uh, so we know the federal government is on the march. What's the most important thing we could do as a policy matter uh, so that we do continue this incredible economic opportunity for our country? That, that sounds like the hardest question to me in terms of the most important thing that Congress can do. If I might just briefly add on your question about peak oil because it's a very interesting one. The, the uh, abundance of oil production and natural gas in, in the United States is not a, a consequence of us suddenly discovering that there's oil or gas here, as you well know. We didn't find a new planet or a country. We got new technology. And uh, what's interesting about the technology aspect of this is technology unleashes the resources, not, not finding new resources per se. And uh, it's an indicator of what the future holds, the idea whether this is a peak or non-peak. We can look at patents as sort of a forward-looking indicator of what's emerging. So in the, we looked at, did some research and looked at the last five years, the number of patents issued in, in uh, non-hydrocarbons, about 60,000. The number of patents issued in the same five years in the hydrocarbon fields is 150,000. So this is a, a permanent shift in the technological revolution. I've asked a lot of people in the industry this question you asked me, and the, the answer is almost always the same, and I know this committee has heard this from other, in other hearings, I've read the witnesses, as everyone says almost universally, those who make things and build things, um, we don't mind accommodating regulations, but you've got to back off, Washington. You've got to help us out here. Uh, we don't, it's not that we don't want to uh, have, do things safely in an environmentally sensible way. Every, every businessman I talk to in every industry is 100, on, on board with this. This is the 21st century. But they're, they are literally crushed by... The quantity, the, the, diverse, the, the diversity, the complexity, and the slowness of regulation. So the regulatory process has evolved and grown in a chaotic way. They're asking for help and for relief, not to have no regulations, but to make sense out of them. And my sense is that with 21st century information technology, we ought to be able to fix this thing. Great. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. At this time, I recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Castor, for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for calling this hearing uh, to highlight the great successes in the energy sector during the Obama administration. Uh, <laughs> and really, we, um, the testimony here from the experts is quite uh, remarkable. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear from Raymond James. Uh, they are headquartered in my area in, in Tampa Bay. Uh, and people all across the country trust uh, your advice. And you were kind enough to do kind of a bullet point uh, presentation. It's very helpful. The U.S. can become energy independent by 2020 under current policy. Uh, before the end of this decade, the U.S. will become the largest oil producer in the world. That's astounding. We have added, America has added more barrels to global supply, global oil supply from 2008 to 2011 than any other country despite the deep water drilling pause uh, necessitated by the most devastating offshore blowout in history, uh, the deep water horizon. On the demand side, uh, good news, petroleum imports have declined 
by 3.8 million barrels per day. Since 2005, oil demand has fallen every year. Oil demand is forecasted to decline, and the main factors that are driving this decline in demand are the policies uh, that the Congress uh, in, in past years and the Obama administration has put in place. They, they include fuel economy, the CAFE standards, and changing consumer preferences a and a decline in miles traveled. Citigroup identifies a minor industrial revolution that's happening in the American heartland. Even the chairman uh, was a, bit, a little bit excited about that. Uh, Mr. Mills has stated there are millions of jobs on the way. That's good news. Uh, Mr. Ham also heralded that America is now number one in natural gas production. Uh, this is all very positive. Uh, and it's interesting, and Mr. Weiss, I'd be interested, you've, uh, I see you smiling on this. Uh, these market conditions really do belie the Republican messaging that has been going on uh, when it comes to energy, that the American energy sector is stagnant. What, how, how do you comment on that? Well, I think the reports from Raymond James and City GPS are very encouraging because they say we can continue to grow our oil industry without expanding into currently protected places that are owned by all Americans. And I think that's very important. Uh, second, like I, I consider the Florida Everglades. As one yes. Of, boy, that's gotten people's attention. And in fact, one of the things that's so disturbing is there's a recent proposal. Um, Mr. Ham uh, heads up uh, Mr. Romney's policy shop for energy, the Romney Energy Plan, would allow states to decide whether or not to drill in federally owned lands. And one of the places where there are already oil holdings, oil leases held in national park units includes the Everglades along with the Flight 93 Memorial. So conceivably, the state of Florida could allow oil drilling in the Everglades uh, under the plan that uh, Mr. Romney has put together. And that would put a very important uh, ecological and economic resource at risk because, as we know, even drilling done as safely as possible uh, has, you know, lots of environmental impacts including roads, spills, benzene, pollution, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, it's, it's off base and it's not needed and that's what a lot of the reports, the testimony here today demonstrate. But one other important element of, of maintaining a diverse approach to Americans, America's energy policy and it's kind of, it's devoid from a lot of the congressional hearings we've had this year, it's devoid from the Romney plan and that's focusing on technology and creating jobs through clean energy. Uh, helping Americans save money, American businesses save money, put money back in their pocket. And I wanted to highlight a, a press report today uh, that's also very positive. There's a revolution happening in solar power. Big box retailers, large chain stores are installing rooftop solar power uh, to help meet their energy needs but to save them money. Walmart, Costco, and Kohl's commercial installations of solar power have increased sharply in recent months. More than 3,600 non-residential systems were activated in the first half of 2012, bringing the number of individual solar electric systems to 24,000. Almost half of the top 20 commercial solar customers are major re retailers like Bed Bath & Beyond and Staples. IKEA, one of the chains in the top 20, plans to have solar arrays on almost all of its furniture stores and distribu distribution centers by the end of the year. So that begs the question, Mr. Ham, why uh, in the Romney uh, energy uh, program and policy, is it completely devoid of creating jobs through technology and, and clean energy? It's so one-sided to oil and gas. Well, there's a lot of technology in all energy sectors. Uh, we know that. And, and it ought to be market-based. And that's what it comes down to is what the market can afford and will afford and will sustain. We're talking about sustainable jobs going forward. And energy that's produced that's twice as, twice as high as everything else uh, may not be there, you know, so it has to come back to what the, the market can afford. You made a comment, I think, on federal land restrictions. You know, we're not talking, nobody's talking here about uh, uh, federal parks and monuments. We're talking about the 40 acres out there in the 1280 that it takes 10 months to get a permit to drill under, not on, uh, out there in North Dakota. 
So there's there's a lot of restrictions out here that uh, something's got to be done about it. Thank you. Gentlelady's time has expired. This time, I recognize the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you having this hearing, and uh, I think a lot of us have been pushing to get North American energy independence within a decade. It's clearly a goal that we can achieve, uh, but it's also clearly a goal that can't be achieved under the current policies of President Obama. And, you know, while some people want to reinvent history and, and reinvent current policy uh, in, in trying to, to change the record, uh, you know, I always find it intriguing when you hear President Obama bragging that production's never been higher. Uh, when, when, first of all, if you look where production is up, because in some areas production's up and in some areas production's down, ironically, production is down in the areas where the president has control on federal lands, and production is up in the areas where he currently does not have control on private lands, but where he and his administration are trying to go shut it down. Uh, so he's bragging about something he doesn't create. I know he's got a good history of, of trying to blame other people for things that happened under his watch, but in this case, he's actually trying to take credit for things that he's actually trying to shut down. Uh, production's lower on federal lands, and that's not disputed by his own Energy Information Administration. Um, I, I do want to correct the record before I get into a few other things. Uh, earlier off, Mr. Rush uh, was, I guess, questioning uh, Mr. Weiss as to why he thinks that uh, some of us uh, feel that the Obama administration has been hostile towards uh, American energy. And, uh, and I think Mr. Weiss's comments were to try to blame it on, on the Macondo well uh, as, if, as if some of us don't want uh, to address that problem. Clearly, uh, you know, we, we pushed hard uh, to see that, and we've seen a dramatic advance in the technology just in the last two years for responding to a disaster like we had. Uh, but at the same time, what a lot of us were concerned about that still makes us hostile today uh, is, number one, the president went in and shut down production, shut down exploration and drilling for six months when his own advisors, the president put together a task force of experts, of scientists and engineers, to look at safety. And his own safety experts said it would be a bad idea and actually reduce safety in the Gulf to have a moratorium. And the president went and doctored the report and put the moratorium in place anyway, tried to blame it on his scientists and engineers. And they said, wait a minute, we think it's a bad idea because you're going to lose your best workers, you're going to lose your best rigs, and that reduces safety. And, in fact, that's what's happened. I mean, we've, got, we've been tracking since Macondo. We've been tracking the rigs that have left the Gulf of Mexico, not to go to other parts of the United States, to go to other countries. And you look at where these assets have gone. Each one of these represents about a billion-dollar investment and about 1,000 American jobs that we've lost because of the president's hostility towards American energy. we have gone to places like Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Egypt, I mean, think about what's going on in Egypt just this week, and yet there are companies that say they'd rather take a billion-dollar investment in 1,000 jobs, and they feel it's better to do business in Egypt with their crazy climate than in the United States of America because of the president's hostility towards American energy production. That's what's going on. That's the record of this administration, and yet he wants to brag that production's never been higher. When he's trying to shut it down, he's been successful in shutting it down to some degree in the Gulf. Mr. Freeman, I want to ask you about that because, uh, you know, if you look at where production is up and where it's down, where is it in the Gulf of Mexico right now? Yeah, um, you know, you've got over 80 percent of your production growth uh, recently and through 2015 is coming from three areas. It's the Bakken Shale in North Dakota, the Eagleford Shale in South Texas, and the Permian in West Texas. Um, the offshore, uh, obviously prior to Macondo, uh, the offshore Gulf of Mexico was under sort of a renaissance. Uh, we'd actually started to grow supply there, started to go to more deeper waters, uh, and supply was up about 250,000 barrels a day in 2009. Uh, last year, supply was down in the Gulf of Mexico, nearly 250,000 barrels a day. So we're we're growing despite the fact that we've got the Gulf of Mexico as sort of a drag. Yeah, so production down on federal lands there in the Gulf of Mexico, of course, we want to see increased safety. Companies that had a great safety record today can't even get a permit. And so they, those jobs are leaving our country. That makes us less secure. That, that kills jobs in America. It kills money that's coming in the federal treasury. One of the reasons President Obama runs up trillion-dollar-plus deficits every year he's been in office, uh, you know, that's billions of dollars not coming in the federal treasury when he sends those jobs to Egypt. He's sending jobs and assets to Egypt because of his policies. And let's, let's not forget that the president himself said he wanted to see electricity prices skyrocket. His energy secretary said he wanted to see gas prices go to the levels they are in Europe. And let's also not forget that one of President Obama's top uh, EPA officials said they want to crucify energy companies. So you wonder why there's a hostility 
uh, towards President Obama's anti-American energy policies, it's because of President Obama's record. We just want him to live up to the words that he says, and yet his policies are destroying energy. And I want to leave on this, Mr. Hamm, because uh, I know you've been very active uh, in, the, in the energy industry where it's growing. Uh, if you can share with us some of the things that you've seen, and when you're making decisions on where to go and explore for energy, do you look on federal lands or do you look on private lands, and do these policies have a factor in that? Well, actually, it's been Continental's policy as much as possible to avoid federal lands just due to the delay. You know, we're a growth company, and we Due to the policies of the administration? Well, yeah, due to the policies of, uh, and restrictions on federal lands. I mean, we've seen permits take as much as two to three years. And, uh, you know, it's just implausible that you can do business in, in that regard. So we've steered clear of them. And you, you see the companies that you know, are not growing very fast, they're involved in federal lands. Jim, time so you'll back the balance. My time is chairman. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you all for your testimony. There's a lot of rhetoric on this topic. I sat through many, many meetings of the Natural Resources Committee, which I served on previously, and uh, we had great debate over um, whether this administration, the the Obama administration, is hostile to. Uh, energy product production um, on land, offshore, um, and uh, on federal lands, et cetera. And the, the argument that that's the case is not supported by the facts. In the last three years, production on federal lands has actually increased compared to the last three years of the uh, Bush administration. Uh, despite all the efforts of certain members of the Natural Resources Committee to argue that a, quote, de facto moratorium had been placed on um, offshore oil production uh, by the uh, conduct of the newly organized agency that oversees that. In fact, the, uh, the timing for obtaining permits has been um, expedited, um, even with building in the new um, safety standards, which are absolutely appropriate after the tragedy um, that occurred. Uh, so I think the, a fact check would, would show that uh, there's been very strong support from this administration with respect to um, offshore, offshore um, oil and gas uh, development as well as with respect to on federal lands. Um, and we, we had a lot of good testimony that showed that the industry holds leases and permits with respect to federal lands that they're not taking um, advantage of, and, and there never seems to be an adequate explanation uh, for that. Um, I had a couple of questions, um, observations. Uh, the, you know, there's two lenses you can bring to this revolution with respect to the abundance of, of uh, resources, energy resources that it's going to offer the country going forward. And you can, you can look at it through um, a lens of, of um, energy independence and, um, you know, in, the inexpensive availability of energy. And if you look at it exclusively through that lens, it looks wonderful. I mean, I, I grant you that. And obviously we want to move towards uh, energy independence, projections of that being able to occur by 2020, which is what I'm hearing, um, are quite exciting. But if you, also, if you add to the lens of this opportunity, um, the issue of impact on the environment and pollution and, and so forth, it doesn't look as great, one has to concede. So the question is how do we kind of blend those perspectives and come up with an approach uh, that makes sense? Because when you talk about oil, um, you talk about, I mean, I think the three energy sources that were, were uh, noted were oil, natural gas, and coal in terms of uh, significant energy production in this country, um, well, they all have issues with respect to the environment, as we know. And natural gas um, is a cleaner opportunity, and that's been um, discussed at length. But uh, as compared with uh, renewable energy sources um, like wind and solar and, and so forth, um, which are much better for the environment, uh, those things, if you look at it through that particular lens, don't maybe look as great. So 
that has to be part of this discussion. And, and one of the questions I have is it, it must be the case that with this new abundance, this new revolution that we're talking about, it gives us more uh, opportunity to um, both explore the environmental concerns and make sure we're doing that right, as well as uh, continue to pursue um, a highly diversified energy portfolio, which includes significant amount of uh, investment in renewable uh, energy resources, as versus a situation where you're so dependent on overseas and, and it's a much more competitive situation. So can, can somebody speak to that? Maybe I'll start with, with you, Mr. Weiss, and actually I'm going to run out of time here, but if you could respond to that. Uh, well, you know, there are lots of opportunities. As you noted correctly, according to CRS, oil production on federal lands is up slightly in 2011 compared to 2007. So, so claims that under President Obama, oil production on federal lands is down is false. Um, in addition, as you also noted, there are consequences to uh, this great abundance that we have. For example, the New York Times reported last year that in North Dakota, quote, Every day, more than 100 million cubic feet of natural gas is flared this way. The flared gas spews at least 2 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which is about as much as almost 400,000 cars. So there are costs to this as well, and that's why we have to have a system where we make sure that we expand the development of these resources in a way that benefits our economy and our security, but also doesn't threaten our economy and our security with uh, climate impacts and other health impacts that will, can be even more expensive. For example, the drought that we're facing today across America is going to cost at least $5 billion in crop damage, and that's the kind of event that's going to occur with more frequency if we don't address the climate piece of energy production and use. Thank you. Jim, my time has expired. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let's stay on that, uh, Mr. Wise, just for a minute. Um, when they go back and they study the, um, the scientists go back and study the, the Dust Bowl of the 30s, um, I find it curious in, in, in my reading that they blame the um, the, the temperature of the oceans, the instability of the oceans, the, the change in the temperature between the Pacific and the Atlantic. I never hear them talk about carbon discharge. And these are all retroactive studies. These are taking today's standards and reapplying them back into that period. Um, can you explain in very short why? I have not looked at the Dust Bowl aspect, but I will tell you this. But the Dust Bowl is probably the I understand. It's the worst drought in America. Drought change, yes. Okay, but, the, but none of the climatologists and the scientists blame climate change. They're talking about what's happened with the Pacific and the, and the Atlantic Ocean and the jet stream. Uh, I, I, I'm troubled. I'm troubled when you know, you, <laughs> let, let me just characterize. I, I get a kick out of you. You've, you've been here several times in, before our meetings. Remember that show, uh, Bat Masterson? Do you remember that half gun will travel? A little bit before my time, Mr. McKinley. Well, perhaps it, it, it may be, but uh, uh, he was brought in when they needed uh, someone with a gun. And, uh, and uh, you show up at all times uh, to, to, to attack uh, the carbon fuel industry, and, and you do a pretty good job of it. But but it's based on, I think, a lot of ideology and not on the facts. Uh, if you go back to be able to prove some of these information that in the past, uh, they just don't demonstrate. You're, you're pushing an issue uh, that just doesn't hold up. Uh, I, I'm just curious, um, do you support the idea of us shipping, exporting coal and gas out of America? I believe that resources, and this is me speaking yes, personally, not for the Center for American Progress uh, Action Fund, I believe that resources that are developed from public lands, which are owned by every American in this room and all across the country, ought to be used for Americans. So that if we are expanding we energy across the board, should we be able to export? I don't know. Once a, one pipe gets, one gas gets in a pipeline, I don't know whether it's come from public lands or private lands. So when we're when we're trying to yeah. ship natural gas out of this country and, and LNG uh, uh, to sell it, to, uh, you, you're opposed to that. I believe that. Yes or no? Just yes or no, please. Um, well, it's not a yes or no question. I believe that yes, it is. And then, then if you're not, then my resources your produced from no. our lands should be kept here. Resources of private land should be exported. There's your answer. So, it, do you think America can afford to be having 
higher utility bills? Uh, no, we are, we need to make sure that. But we, can can we? You don't you don't think we can afford it? Can but remember, there are other prices included in the cost of burning coal than just the price of the coal and the land and the facility itself. For example, the health care costs from air pollution, mercury, soot, uh, toxic chemicals, cancer-causing agents, is in the billions of dollars in there. The and under the EPA right. rule, it says $3 you know, of benefits for every $1 of cleanup cost. They're saying that the worst air is your air that's indoor, not our outdoor air. Even the EPA says it's 96 times worse indoors than our outdoor air. So no, well, we ought to no, address indoor air pollution as well, but that doesn't mean we ought to spew thousands of pounds of mercury, which is a known neurotoxin. And you should well know that there's more mercury in a can of tuna fish than there is in a can of fly ash. So and where did the mercury get the, into the tuna fish? It came so, from eat, air pollution. We eat the tuna fish. We don't eat the fly ash. Let's go on to this thing. That, so what... what what percent are you trying to get to in terms of fossil fuels? Where, what, what, where do you want us to take us uh, uh, when you come in with these kind of testimonies? Uh, do you want us down with coal to eliminate coal, or are you trying to get us down to 20 percent? What, what's your vision that you think would be right for America? I think what's right for America is to use our resources in a way. Percentage-wise. Um, I won't give you a figure, but I think we ought to use our resources in a way that allows us to also not have kids have asthma attacks, not have pregnant women not be You don't know whether the asthma attack is caused by the outdoor air or the indoor air quality. No, we you do know that. We don't know whether right. asthma is caused by that, but there's studies by Harvard University and other medical schools that show that asthma attacks increase with the frequency of air pollution. We're not saying it causes asthma, but it causes asthma Thank attacks. Thank you. And you don't know whether that asthma attack has been caused by dust mites, aerosols, or, or formaldehyde sprays in your house. So. Let, let me go. I'll be happy to provide some studies to you for the record. Do you have some other information that indicates that anything other than the fact that the CO2 emissions now in, the, in this country are the lowest they've been in 20 years? Um, I don't believe that's accurate, sir. I believe that they have gone down in recent years, but I, uh, 2005. Uh, EIA just published that. Okay, weeks. well, I'll have to. Maybe I will double check that. Read up before you come here and testify again. I, okay, and I who is Bat Masterson's top mind. opponent? Because you are quite a worthy one, sir. <laughs> I don't know his name either, but Mr. Sullivan, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Weiss. Um, it was interesting when you were discussing in your comments earlier, you said that the oil and gas industry gets this handout subsidy. Um, I think you're referring to intangible drilling. And I, and I was wondering are you, how long you've worked for the Center for American Progress, and um, you've worked there a while, I'm sure. Um, do, you ever, do you ever travel around the country at all to go to conferences or anything like that? Yes or no? Well, that's a two-part question. Yes, I travel around the country. No, I generally don't attend conferences. Do you ever you go, but you travel for your job? Uh, ever? Sometimes. Yeah. And when you do that, you have meals and hotel and lodging. Does your company pay that? You send it back to them? They, they pay that? You get expensing on that? They expense yes. that? Okay. It's cost of doing business, isn't it? Right? Yeah. Do you think that's a handout subsidy giveaway to your group? Well, first of all, is we're, it or not? Yes or no? No, it's not because okay, we're a nonprofit I'd like to ask tax Mr. exempt organization. Okay, I'd like to ask Mr. Ham. Me. Mr. Ham, intangible drilling is important to the industry. Now, they don't hand you a check and give you just a check. The government's not handing you a check. And Mr. Ham drills wells that are sometimes don't come in, unfortunately. He's lost money. Oil prices have been down very low in the past. A lot of people aren't. The president even said he, yeah, this is a, a, a industry of yesterday. How are we going to get young people in the business when he says something like that? Because of the ups and downs of the business in the past. So he gets expensing. If he doesn't drill it, he doesn't get it. You don't travel, you don't get it for your group. Now, I'd like Mr. Ham to comment on, on how important that is to this industry. Well, it's very important. It would cut 35 to 40 percent of our activity, you know, if we wasn't able to expense the cost for labor. And that's what it comes down to. I drilled 17 dry holes in a row, and there's no subsidy in this business. I, I guess I went up to the wrong window. Nobody <laughs> handed me a check. So we, uh, you know, it, we take a lot of inherent risk in this business, and we certainly have to have some room to try and fail. If it wasn't for that, we would not be having this revolution in energy that we have today. You know, it took 16 years, you know, in the Barnett to break the code. 
you know, it took 18 uncommercial wells in a Bakken to break the code. So it's a, it's a very expensive process. A lot of research and development, a lot of money went into that. And uh, it is, it's expensive. And if, you know, right now uh, we're, we're getting all this, we import a lot of oil. It's gone down somewhat, but we're importing oil into this country. We have oil here in the Bakken, for example, a tremendous amount. It's mind-boggling. And, uh, you know, they need, we need to get that out. Why, why not produce that? And if we had to took this away, just to the expensing, not a handout, not a giveaway, not a subsidy, it's not that, 30% reduction? And that's asinine to do that. And we, we just bring more oil into this country. We, we can produce oil here in the United States of America, American-made energy right under our feet. God's given us a great resource. Let's use it. And we, and we have people that don't want to do that. But it's just mind-boggling to me. I, I don't understand that, and I guess I never will. Mr. Um, Sullivan, may I respond? What, yeah. Very briefly. What I, point I'm trying to make is the production tax credit for wind energy is similar to the intangible drilling cost rule that um, Mr. Ham uses for his business. It helps provide certainty. It helps provide support. It helps keep their business growing, especially this is a, an, in, an industry that's in teenage years as opposed well, to Well, this industry, is, with all due respect, wouldn't survive without the PTC. This industry, Mr. Ham said this industry would Mr. Not, Ham's industry would go down 30 percent, and right now we need to have, uh, we need to have more, uh, much oil produced here in the United States as possible. I think it's ridiculous to send billion dollars every single day overseas to buy foreign oil and have that money bounce around other economies and subsidize other nations and their economies. We have people hurting here, and it can bounce around our economy, have a dynamic economic effect here. That's, it, it makes perfect sense. And, Mr. Freeman, my next question is to you. In your testimony, you cite aging workforce as one of the challenges facing the oil and gas industry. Do you think young people are encouraged to enter this sector when their president, President Obama, refers to it as yesterday's industry? Uh, it's, it's obviously the perception of the oil and gas industry uh, is one that for uh, quite a while has been one that's been difficult to attract a uh, younger population to. Uh, I think you've generally had to see, like I mentioned earlier, the average age of a, a petroleum engineer in this country is 50 years old. So you're constantly having to ask them to work longer uh, and longer because we are having a very difficult time um, attracting younger people to this uh, to this industry despite all of its uh, upside um, and how dynamic the industry is. It's uh, unfortunately the perception that's out there is, a, is not a positive one. Wouldn't it be better for our leaders to promote this industry as a good place to work in, that we can produce more American-made energy as a national security issue to lessen our dependence on foreign oil, get more young people involved in this energy renaissance, and have American-made energy? Isn't that a better idea? A absolutely. There's a reason the highest-paid undergraduate job coming out of college is a petroleum engineer who can make six figures. Wow. We need so it's not the, it's, it's not the uh, uh, yesterday's industry. In your testimony also, you explained that between 2008 and 2011, the U.S. added more barrels to global supply than any other country despite the Obama administration's moratorium because of onshore production. Five years ago, was, wasn't the Gulf of Mexico supposed to be the major growth area for domestic oh, oil yeah. production? We started that before the NSR. Do you want to respond? Yes, sir. It, it, that's, that's correct. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that the Gulf of Mexico was one of the few sources of, uh, of growth. Uh, obviously, uh, as it's been uh, talked about in this, in this hearing, uh, the renaissance that we, we took first took place in natural gas has transformed itself uh, to oil. Uh, just, I mean, one play that may be interesting, and then I'll, I'll wrap up. I know that we're out of time. You know, the Eagleford Shale in South Texas wasn't producing a barrel of oil uh, just three years ago, and now you're producing over 500,000 barrels a day. Uh, it's that sort of development that's, uh, that's put the, this country in the position it's in. Gentlemen's time's expired. Can I get 15 seconds? Uh, yeah. oil, Mr. I mean, oil, you're over here. Okay. Over. I'll, uh, Ms. Capps from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Weiss, I understand you uh, weren't able to complete uh, your answer to Mr. McKinley, uh, and I'd love to give you a couple seconds to respond, but I do have questions for you and also Mr. Purcell, so I hope. Um, they... I, I'll take the questions. I was finished with um, responding to Mr. McKinley. Okay. Thank you.
Anyway, I, I, then I will proceed. You've suggested investing more federal funding for clean energy as a benchmark a target to target for the U.S. staying competitive. You've argued this would support the government's partnerships and innovation with the private sector and would also help give the private sector greater access that it needs to develop, deploy, and commercialize clean energy technologies. I think you'd agree we already have many cleaner energies all ready to go. Um, we just have to get them into the marketplace. Do you have any suggestions for us on ways to get these technologies deployed and how they would make us more energy self-sufficient in this nation? Would freeing up federal funds be helpful? I think you've suggested removing fossil fuel production subsidies uh, to be a, a possible solution. Uh, uh, I have two quick examples. First, uh, as Mr. Purcell talked about, extending the production tax credit for wind energy will help that uh, – that industry continue to grow. We've doubled wind energy production in the last four years. Uh, the equivalent, and right now wind produces the equivalent of a, a, over 20 nuclear power plants. I think that's right, or is it 11? Something like that. A lot of energy. Uh, so let's continue that. And it's expanding in states like as uh, Texas and Oklahoma is a growing wind energy state as well. Second, uh, Representative Biggert and Representative Markey have a bill uh, that would invest a small amount of money in a race to the top to build uh, recharging stations for plug-in hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles. Uh, let's do that so that way people will have recharging stations. In fact, uh, Congress has just agreed to put in recharging stations on both the House and Senate side for their members and staff who drive plug-ins or electric vehicles. I think we ought to do that in communities as well. And that, uh, the bigger Markey bill, would cost like $400 million. It's a very small amount in a race to the top to help build the infrastructure to give people certainty to drive these vehicles that use little or no gasoline. But actually, to follow on, um, Mr. Weiss, uh, we've seen recent legislative proposals which would undermine these very standards. For example, a bill to overturn lighting efficiency standards, a policy that would result in our going, foregoing the need for 30 additional large power plants and consumers, which would collectively save more than $10 billion consumers would on their electricity bills each year. But here's... Um, uh, and next week, we might have legis legislation on the floor to delay or block EPA standards that, when fully implemented, will save lives and improve public health and encourage clean energy job creation and economic growth. So, Mr. Weiss, what's the real impact of delaying or blocking standards that will encourage innovation and more investments in clean energy? Would you say that stopping these standards would hurt America's chances of achieving energy independence? Uh, delaying the standards won't... Uh affect our ability to produce more oil, um, and, uh, domestic oil or na and natural gas. What it will do is delaying standards on uh, pollution from power plants, boilers, and cement kilns would increase the number of premature deaths to something like 24,000 people annually, thousands of hospitalizations, and tens of thousands of asthma attacks. And it would cost, I believe, uh, close to $200 billion a year in additional health care costs and lost productivity. Productivity, delaying those standards, huge human cost, huge economic cost, no impact on producing more oil and gas. Okay, and finally, Mr. Purcell, I'm one of many bipartisan supporters in this Congress of the Wind Energy PTC, the production technology uh, 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 credits. Many of us have companies in our congressional districts that have benefited from the PTC. Clipper Wind, for example, which laid off 170 employees last month in Iowa is headquartered in my congressional district. They tell me that, that the uncertainty about the PTC being extended is the, is the reason that we've seen now a slowdown in, in this industry just when it's, as you said, Mr. Weiss, just taking off uh, like the wind is, it, it, as, as you could say. I think that point has been pretty well made already, but I want to ask you about the importance of extending the PTC not only to provide certainty to your industry, but as a long-term extension, I'd argue, wouldn't this even lead to more innovation within the industry if you have that certainty of, what, of getting those tax credits? <clears throat> yeah, in my opinion, it would. Um, I do know that uh, because of the uncertainty, uh, there have been um, huge commitments for research and development uh, centers by the, ma the major uh, wind turbine manufacturers um, canceled uh, in the U.S. in places like uh, Massachusetts and in Texas in Colorado where these research and development uh, facilities were planned um, to continue the development uh, for uh, wind energy um, productivity and efficiency um, that will allow it to stand on its own. And I might add, if I will, um, uh, to Mr. Pompeo's comment about uh, con consistently, uh, consistently asking for a production tax credit renewal, 
Um, the last time that we had a major extension, we felt like it was a bridge to a federal renewable electricity standard, which we were very close to, if you remember, in 2008, uh, right before the uh, financial crisis, which, uh, which steered the, the country in a different direction. So we felt like the production tax credit was a way to a, a federal long-term stable policy to help us uh, finish the job and become competitive and, and provide a long-term solution for clean energy. So um, the production tax credit is what we need today. Uh, it's the most viable thing to continue uh, the work we're doing. Um, however, there are some other vehicles we think would also be helpful um, for future, including a renewable and electricity standard. Thank you. Thank you very much. This time, recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Griffith, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mills, could you go over those patent numbers again? I wasn't able to write them down fast enough for the, the new patents in the hydrocarbon field and the new patents in the alternative energy field. Sorry. Yes, sir, I'd, I'd be happy to. In fact, uh, as I mentioned, the reason we looked at patents was as a uh, forward-looking indicator of where innovation is, has been happening and where it's going to go. Uh, the aggregate total patents issued and not filed, so the issuances are the, the measure that matters all right. in all the alternative energy domains. So this was a very broad sweep. Yes, sir. Wind, I solar mean, efficiency. 60,000 patents issued roughly all right. in, all, in hydrocarbon technologies, all, all flavors, uh, coal, oil, and gas. That industry has issued 150,000 patents over the same five years, the innovators and engineers in that business. All right, thank you very much. And from, if I can paraphrase what I think I heard you, you, your testimony reading between the lines was is that we're at a turning point in our country. If we choose to use the, the God-given resources, the natural things that are here, the energy sources that we have, we can remain number one nation economically in the world for many, many years to come. It's a choice we have to make. If we choose not to use them, you see us perhaps not being number one nation say, 20, 30, 40 years from now. Is that correct? That's, that's a fair assessment. Other, other countries will supply the fuels, but importantly, the industries in this country that know, know, have pioneered this technology will go to the other countries to Make produce the fuels. Instead of making us rich. Correct. Let me shift because I only have a certain amount of time. Uh, Mr. Freeman, I noticed in your written testimony you said that uh, we were number one in natural gas and in a few years we'd be number one in oil production, but that we're number two in coal. Uh, who's beating us in coal production? Uh, China. And, and that's not an unexpected uh, answer on my part. I have to say that has not always been the case, has it? They've not always beaten us in coal? No, that's a very recent phenomenon. And it, it's important because we heard earlier about some, you know, some jobs being lost, and any job being lost is bad. But I will tell you that in my district we lost 620 coal jobs. Uh, a plant was idled uh, within the last several weeks. And over the summer in the central Appalachian region we've lost more than 2,000 jobs. And so that's extremely important. Um, you know, I was struck by some of the, the testimony, particularly the testimony of Mr. Weiss, that uh, in, implied that those of us who advocate for North American energy independence are advocating to drill in our national parks. I don't think anyone here is advocating that we drill in the parks. Uh, you state in your testimony that parks would be vulnerable if federal oversight of energy on public lands is eliminated in favor of more relaxed state regulations. I have to say, I've got it right here, and the Romney Energy Plan speaks to states being empowered to establish processes to oversee the development and production of all forms of energy on federal lands within their borders. But it specifically, that Romney Plan, and what most of us would, would be for, specifically excludes lands that are uh, designated as off-limits. When we talk about getting North American energy independence, we aren't talking about drilling in the parks. We're talking about... Uh, leasing more than 3% of the nation's federal lands, which are quite substantial, taking, uh, setting up government, government policies, which would make it so that, you know, it takes less than six years to get a permit to drill in federal waters. I think Mr. Ham talked about the length of time it takes if you're on federal land to get a permit, and allowing pipelines like the KXL um, uh, Keystone Pipeline to help bring millions of barrels of secure oil from our friends and neighbors in Canada. And I just wanted to make sure that I got the record set straight on that because I think it's important that we recognize that nobody is planning on drilling on the site where the flight crashed. That's not a part of anybody's plan. Ah, my turn. And, I, and, and you've said that several times, and, and I have to tell you, um, I, I'm a little offended by that implication that anyone in this Congress or that any presidential candidate would plan on putting an oil well 
at a sacred site like that. So I, I wanted to get that out and felt very strongly about it. Uh, Mr. Mills, uh, I noticed in your written testimony, in your oral testimony, you said, uh, you know, you had drill, dig, build, and ship. And I have to tell you that I have the four Ds, uh, which first two are the same, drill and dig. Uh, I then have uh, deregulate and discover. Deregulation means we have our universities trying to find ways that whether it be wind energy, algae, I don't care. I'm a true all of the above uh, that we move forward in that direction. And one of the problems that I've seen with what I think is going on in this administration, although sometimes it's hard to figure out, is that they see the alternatives as the next great step forward. And it, it may very well be, but I find with some interest, and I wonder if you agree with me, that in all the previous revolutions on energy, when, when we went from wood to charcoal and then we went from you know, charcoal to, and wood to using uh, uh, oil and natural gas and, and, and coal, that each step that we have made, we didn't cut the legs out from under the older industry. We continue to use those industries, and it seems that this administration wants to eliminate the previous energy sources with a you know, we're going to use all of the above, but it has to be one of the energy sources we like because the Sierra Club has beyond g natural gas now. They used to have beyond coal. They've now made a second to China. Do you agree with that general assessment? Yeah, I think the, I think the, the assessment is correct. We've always used the trailing technology, so to speak, but we, importantly, have made them better, cheaper, cleaner by using new technologies on the old fuels. So that was the whole point of my, my, patent, uh, my patent research, is that the, there's enormous opportunity for solar and wind around the world. There's no question about it. And if 20 or 30 percent of the world's energy came from alternatives, that would be marvelous. I expect it to happen, or more. But it still leaves the rest of the number, which is the 60 or 70 percent, which has come from, will have to come from hydrocarbons using advanced technologies. Absolutely correct. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, yes, uh, Mr. Reddish. Would it be uh, out of order if we just had a, another round for one question? Sure. One, one question, please. That's a good idea. I'll ask mine first. Sure. Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Howard, you're the president and CEO of the Canadian uh, Energy Research Institute. Uh, I would just like to know what was the reaction when the Keystone Pipeline yes, permit was denied and is it the intent of Canada to at least explore building a pipeline to the west for export? W would you mind just giving me your personal impressions about all that? Uh, simply put, when it was first rejected or, or delayed, um, pretty much nobody knew what to do. That was the very first time in Canadian history that an oil pipeline had been turned down. Um, as far as moving forward, I think the attitude in Canada is when it happens, great, but we're not going to wait. As far as Canada exporting crude outside of the country, it is a, a, a position that the federal and provincial governments, the industry, is on board with. Uh, we are pursuing looking for other markets. That is becoming a challenge. Uh, the Northern Gateway Pipeline is similar to the Keystone XL in the sense that the environmental pushback is more significant than anybody ever imagined. Uh, the Trans Mountain expansion is a little different because it's uh, an expansion system. I personally think that will go ahead. Uh, the potential for moving bitumen from west to east to feed the eastern refineries, eastern Canadian refineries, I think is an option. As far as if Keystone XL does not get built, I think crude or bitumen could still reach the Gulf of Mexico by tanker by going out through the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes, Mr. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, Mr. Hamm, um, the oil industry gets $4 billion a year in tax breaks from the federal government. The wind industry gets about $4 billion a year in tax breaks. Um, for the production tax credit for wind. And uh, do you think that's fair? Do you think we should keep both tax breaks on the books? You know, we, I think that our industry should be able to expense our labor costs just like any other industry. Uh, no, I'm asking about the wind. Do you think the wind uh, tax break should stay on the books? I, I, I don't know. My, my business is not wind. And yeah. uh, 
and certainly I don't consider what we're getting as a tax break when it's the same as all others. So, uh, you know, the uh, what what goes on with wind is a whole nother business. No, I got you. You know, that's the problem that we have with the Romney uh, tax break. You know that Romney is going to, uh, if he becomes president, allow the wind tax break to expire at the end of this year. Amazing, huh? And, uh, and the industry says that 40,000 people will be laid off next year because of Romney's wind policy. Uh, and you know what I think? I think the, the fear is that the Republicans are so tied to the oil industry, you know, that you know, they can't give up the, those tax breaks while at the same time maintaining a commitment uh, to saving the taxpayers' money over in the wind sector, huh? which is going to actually install 12,000 new megawatts of wind uh, this year, dwarfing coal, dwarfing oil, dwarfing, dwarfing uh, the nuclear industry. And it's really, it's, it's frightening to the fossil fuel uh, industry. And so this, um, this uh, you know, completely biased oil above all policy, tax breaks for the oil industry, and nothing for wind. Huh? It's not, that's not all of the above, that's oil above all. Oil above all. Look at all these great jobs here. You know, these jobs are just as great as the jobs Mr. Freeman was just talking about, but they don't care about these jobs, okay? Just the oil jobs, not oil jobs. We don't care about them, huh? And that's the kind of dual standard that the Republicans want us to, expe uh, want us to accept even as oil has dropped from 57% imported to 45% imported since Bush walked out the door in January. Of, you know, that's arithmetic. 57% under, um, under Bush imported, 45% today. That's a, great, that's a good record for Obama. That's a drill baby drill Obama administration, uh, and it's continuing to go down. 50% uh, more rigs drilling in the Gulf of Mexico today than before the BP spill. Fantastic, huh? Record highs in natural gas, wind, solar. And what do the Republicans have as their platform? Kill wind, you know? Kill these renewables. That's a disaster for our country. That's all, that's the single largest domestic source of energy in our country, wind and solar, 20 and 30 years from now, right? It's fantastic. And what else does, what else does Romney say? Romney says he doesn't like the fuel economy standards. Now, what will those fuel economy standards do on the vehicles that we drive, 54.5 miles per gallon? I know because I authored the language here uh, in the House of Representatives. That's, that's 3 million barrels of oil per day. Where is he going to make that up from? Well, Romney says he wants to drill off the beaches of Massachusetts and California rather than have just the vehicles be more efficient while the industry is having a complete revival. This whole Romney energy plan, who haven't put it together, it's a complete mess. It's upside down. It's like the, the craziest upside down energy policy I've ever heard who ever put it together, right? It ignores the reality of what's really working and it wants to go over to kind of this age old policy where you have to subsidize stuff that's not working. Do you agree with me, Mr. Ham? I don't agree with you at all. I oh. think that uh, it ought to be market based and, and that's what I've said earlier. If you well, subsidies for oil policy, and no I'm, subsidies I'm for wind is market based? I don't think so. I don't think so. How can that be market based? Adam Smith would spin in his grave and, and qualify for an energy tax break. Uh, uh, he'd be so, you know, he'd be so agitated that you can ma maintain that's market-based, that oil gets a tax break and wind doesn't? Well, that's, that, you know, when the president went down, when, I mean, not when the president went down, when, when uh, Romney went down to Houston just three weeks ago and had his oil baron summit with all those oil company CEOs, he raises $6 million from them and then says, I'm going to get my energy policy from them, crossing the T's and dotting the I's on my policy, he says. And then on Thursday, just two days later, three weeks ago, he has a press conference, you know? And what is his press conference? Oil above all. And he doesn't support tax breaks for wind after leaving an oil barren summit, Mr. Ham. So how can, how can the American people trust that energy policy to really be all, uh, all of the above instead of oil above all? Gentleman's time's expiring. I might ask the gentleman from Massachusetts, since your party controlled the White House, the House, and the Senate for two years, just two years ago, why didn't you extend the production tax credit for the wind industry? You had the power to do it. We did you it. had the authority we to do it. We extended it. And you didn't do it. We did extend it. Well, you could have extended it longer than the expiration at the end of this month, of December. Why didn't you take that action? 
Romney has nothing to do with this. Romney is not Romney's in power letting, right now. Romney's letting it expire. Point point of, by the way, point of your, of your, chairman, point point your, of your chairman, energy department gives chairman, $538 million to Selena, point of, George chairman, Kaiser, a bundler of, for the chairman. president. Look at coal. Coal was, coal was 51% of well, all. I mean, and you're not interested in coal jobs, no, are you? That's, that's point because of natural gas. Point natural point gas is killing coal in the free market. Natural gas is killing. You had the opportunity to extend the production Chairman, tax credit. Mr. Chairman, you all come. Mr. Uh, Rush, I'm going to recognize you Please. for five minutes. All right. I don't need five minutes. Uh, Mr. Markin, I'm going to outside. Mr. Mills, what do you think about this? <laughs> no, no, let me just... I, I, I wanted, Mr. Mills, I do have a question for you, <clears throat> because you, you had some very interesting testimony, and I, I'm really kind of inclined to uh, lean, lean your way, but I, I'm interested in why there is no, have been no mention from you as it relates to environmental concerns. What do you think of uh, the climate change <clears throat> uh, speed bump? On this expressway uh, uh, that we uh, that the industry is headed down, what do you think they fit in at these speed bumps? So how much attention should we pay toward the environmental concerns, or should we just ignore environmental concerns altogether? Uh, thanks for the question, Mr. Rush, and I, I do want to make a very quick observation that I thought Congressman Markey's visual aids were the best at the hearing, and uh, so far, thank you, sir. <laughs> Uh, and I, 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 would, uh, I would say that uh, I know that I personally, but in all the people I talk to in the industry uh, on the broad environmental issues, there is support for safety and environmental metrics. It's, you don't find pushback from the industry. You look, you look, the issues that are looked for are consistency and, and simplicity and uh, adherence to standards of time, which is one of the biggest complaints I hear from industry practitioners, that the deadlines aren't met. Uh, the climate issue is an interesting one, an extraordinarily uh, tough challenge for everybody on both sides of the aisle. I, I recognize that. But I would just say this is a practical matter. The, the fact is that we know that all the energy growth in the world is occurring outside of the United States. So if the United States ceased to exist tomorrow or consumed no energy at all or had all of its energy from non-hydrocarbons, the consumption of hydrocarbons in the world is going to go up significantly, probably by double over where it is today. So the, the proposition that I'm putting on the table is not is, is essentially independent of, of uh, whether those hydrocarbons emit carbon dioxide. By definition, they do. I'm simply saying that other people will supply those hydrocarbons to the world market. We can do it and make money and create jobs. We can do it cleaner and more efficiently than anybody else in the world. That's, the, that's an opportunity we have inside of a reality that's locked in. The demographic reality of the rest of the world is, is simply locked in. More are going to be used globally. So I, I would love to see America be the leader in supplying those fuels for economic reasons, uh, social reasons. It will generate all kinds of wealth, which we can fund all kinds of R&D, and frankly, geopolitical reasons. We all have more control over world markets. The gentleman yields back, and there seems to be no one else here to ask questions, and I think Mr. Mark is gone. Oh, oh, oh Mr. Griffith, I'm sorry. You're recognized. Coke. Make steel better with natural gas or coke from coal? We, we actually use uh, the steel for the towers that we make out of scrap metal and add the, uh, so we're not using traditional coal uh, and, and iron uh, in, at the steel plant that we make the steel. But yes, there are steel mills uh, in Indiana that uh, are near us that do use coal, sir, and, and natural, a lot of natural gas as well. Yeah. But the best stuff is still made from coke, is it not? Uh, for certain steel makers, uh, they still use an awful lot of it, yes, sir. So when we're being beaten in the world market and I lose 620 jobs in a metallurgical coal mine, that means we're doing something wrong, I, I would submit to you. Um, you know, it's been an interesting hearing and we've heard a lot of things. The, the bottom line is, is that, you know, we can put up all the charts we want. Apparently the wind industry has lost 1,752 jobs already. Yet, as you heard the testimony, Mr. Markey wasn't here to hear the, the information I put in earlier. In my region alone, we've lost 2,000 coal jobs just this summer. So 
you know, I believe in all of the above. I believe in trying to make sure that we have everything on the table, and I believe that we need to make the government responsive and understand that if, if we just get out of the way of people like Mr. Ham, I think that we have a very bright future in this country. We have the best workers in the world, and we have the greatest supply of energy. But if we continue to, 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 if we continue to throw more regulations on and more regulations on like wet blankets on the fire of enterprise, we will be doing our nation a disservice, and my children and everybody else's children and grandchildren will have a lesser America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. So that's the end of the, today's hearing. I want to thank you panel members for being very patient, and uh, we appreciate your testimony very much, and look forward to working with all of you as we move forward to address these issues. And we'll keep the record open for uh, 10 days, and... Uh, Thank you once again. That concludes today's hearing. Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to ask one question of you. Yes, sir. Can't we all just get along? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>